The heat is well and truly on in the nation's capital. It's 35.7 Celsius. That's 96 Fahrenheit. It's as hot as it's been all day. And here at MIT Ballpark, it's about to get a whole lot hotter as week seven in the Australian Baseball League gets underway tonight. And welcome to Canberra for week seven of the Australian Baseball League. My name is Chris Coleman. It's so great to be with you on a seriously hot evening. And it has not cooled down. In fact, it is the hottest it's been all day. The Bureau of Meteorology has said there's a heat wave coming. It arrived today and it's going to continue across the weekend. It's going to make it very interesting for our friends from across the ditch where it doesn't usually get this hot. Uh, and we have a man who represents that team from across the ditch in uh, the commentary with me tonight, Josh Colmenter from the Auckland Tuatara. Great to have you on board this evening. Welcome to Canberra. Thank you, Chris, and thank you for turning the heat on for us when we got here. <laughs> I hope you've had a chance to at least take advantage of the pool at the hotel at some stage. Yeah, we have. We've gone from probably nothing over what would be 70, maybe 75 Fahrenheit for us so far, and then all of a sudden we jump right into this. So definitely a little bit of a... <laughs> of a heat shock coming over here. And you're throwing on Saturday night. Uh, I know you've played in some hot places uh, in the USA. Uh, you'll be right at home on Saturday night where they're still talking about it being high 30s when you go out there on the dime of the first pitch. Yeah, that's the beauty of pitching when it's hot. You don't hardly have to throw any warm-up pitches. You don't have to worry about keeping your arm warm or anything between the inning breaks. Uh, the weather won't let you get cold. <laughs> that's for sure. The umpires for the team you can see out there, we'll give them a quick wrap now. Blake Halligan, from memory, the first time he's umpired here at Canberra, and he gets the good one, the best seat in the house at home plate tonight. First base umpire is Riley Barrington, the third base umpire, Matthew Pearson. We'll have a look at some of the players who were involved in the game shortly. But, of course, the Canberra Cavalry being run by Keith Ward. On the coaching staff, a man who has been a big part of Canberra baseball for quite some time, and it's a big weekend for many reasons. Let's find out with uh, Canberra Cavalry coach Michael Wells. Big weekend, Michael Wells. Let's talk about, firstly, positions in the ABL. Very much up for grabs. Certainly are. It's a big weekend for us at the Cavalry. Um, you know, had a good series last weekend against Geelong, so a good opportunity for us to take some more games this weekend and hopefully roll us into Sydney next week. In division games worth a heap, you've got to pick up those wins. Absolutely, like especially when you're playing at home, you know, look to win those series. Um, I think Brisbane and Sydney are going at it this weekend too, so it's a pretty big series up there for them. Tell us about Auckland. Uh, they, they, they picked up a couple of wins over the ditch uh, a few weeks ago. How did the Cavalry improve? Um, yeah, we had some guys, you know, obviously found some form last week against Geelong Korea, so hopefully we can keep rolling along, keep hitting the ball, and guys coming out of the bullpen and throwing strikes. Just seems that the hitting is improving game on game now, just slowly but surely. Yeah, we guys are getting more confidence, so like I said, doing a lot of work in the cages during the week, so yeah, guys are finding form at the right time of the season. Uh, of course, you've been a part of a lot of big developments in baseball in Canberra. Uh, not only a member of the Cavalry Championship side and the Asia Series side, but go back, you're a member of the Bush Rangers. Big weekend for the Bush Rangers and people who remember baseball from the 1990s. Yeah, it should be a good uh, Saturday night. I think we've got the guys coming, uh, guys from the previous team coming out. Um, should have about 15 guys, you know, guys from Melbourne, Sydney. Um, yeah, have a big good night for the Cavalry to you know, honour those guys who came before them. And who are you most looking forward to catching up to on Saturday? A uh, bunch of guys, you know, like I say, you know, Matty Everham from Sydney, David Simpson, David White from Melbourne, you know, Gary Wales from Sydney, guys you haven't seen for, you know, probably 10, 15 years, so it should be good. Good luck, Wellesie. Thank you. Michael Wells, a man who was an integral part of the Canberra Cavalry Championship side in 2013, both here in the ABL and in the Australian, uh, the Asian Club Championship. You can see the Cavalry taking to the field. We'll have a look at who they've got. We'll have a look at who the Auckland Tuatara have for you in just a moment. Week 7 ABL action getting underway very, very soon. It's the Auckland Tuatara at the Canberra Cavalry at MIT Ballpark in the nation's capital, Canberra. Across the horizon, you jump, skip, and hop, and never 
See this? This is what you mean to us. No, seriously. Why? Because we see greatness in you. It's right there, inside, just waiting to be discovered. And we should know, because we're number one too. Number one in the ACT, for full-time employment, for starting salary, for student support and learning resources. Yep, all the things that matter. So even though we're number one, you're still number one to us. Might sound corny, but hey, it's 100% true. The Auckland Tuatara will be making their way out into the batter's box in that order this evening. Really looking forward to seeing this side and see how they go compared to a few weeks ago when they pinched a couple of games off Canberra uh, in Auckland. A rain-affected series, uh, all day games there. This time it couldn't be much more different. It is hot, it is dry, they're all night games. And Josh Colmenter, you know these guys terribly well. Tell, tell us, uh, this lead-off man, Eric Jenkins, he is hot, hot, hot at the moment. Yeah, he's been a great player for us all the way through men's center field. I think he's played out there almost every game. And we're going with a lot of righties, obviously, against the lefty tonight. And our forte is right-handed hitting, but Jenkins has been in the leadoff spot all year and loves to get on base and look to steal. Looking at uh, a few players who are fairly new to the lineup as well, the, uh, the second baseman and the catcher. Yeah, we just picked them up last week. We had uh, catcher get her, a couple catchers get hurt, so we were just looking for someone. And uh, he's been playing over in the Gold Coast in some club ball. Caught a couple games last week, did well, holds his own in there. And um, then Nick Tannel, who's supposed to be a big prospect with the Astros, so he showed up and played a couple games for us last week. And you can obviously tell he knows what he's doing out there. So hopefully having a week to get his feet under him and look for a lot of, a lot of action out of him this weekend. Out there on the mound, they'll be up against this man, Stephen Kent, who has been absolutely lights out this season. He comes in with a 4-0 win-loss record on ERA of 2.89. Tell us a little bit about him via our scouting report. Yeah, I mean, the way he pitched against us last week is right into the scouting report. Has a big fastball, loves using it, um, and uses it to get ahead. And if he needs to throw you know, the changeup probably to righties or that curveball slider to lefties, but he likes going right at you, attacking, and he's going to come at you with everything he's got. Oh, Steve Kent goes uh, for the fastball straight down the pipe first up. Jenkins swings at the first pitch. Underneath it is Cam Warner. Takes it comfortably. And we have one pitch, one out. Fast start to a hot game. <laughs> That's what you like as a pitcher. Especially when it's hot out there. You just want to throw strikes, get the defense to make some plays for you, and get off the field and let your guys go to hitting. Uh, what do you prefer, Josh, as, as a pitcher? You know, do you prefer it when a batter goes after you on the first couple of pitches, or do you, do you rather let him take a couple uh, so you can see what he's looking for? For me, it's all about efficiency. I love when guys swing, and that's one of the biggest things in scattering reports that I like to have is if a guy will swing, oh, oh, because if you get against an ag aggressive guy or an aggressive team, you can use that against him, throw him a changeup or something that looks like a fastball and get him off balance, and it's an easy out. Well, this is Taylor Schneider. He comes in shortstop with a 2.12 uh, average. Just a half a dozen hits for him from limited game time so far this season. And Kent doing nicely with the strikes so far. Yeah, that's his game. It's, he comes right at you with the fastball, throws a lot of strikes, and makes you hit him. So you have to be on your toes when you're in the box. Some hitters like that. Some hitters prefer a guy that pitches a little bit. But against a, hitter, a pitcher like that, you've got to match his aggress aggressiveness, and we might see the Tuatara jump all over pitches early in the count. And he's got behind early as Snyder and takes the breaking ball. Ooh. That one might have, <laughs> might have <laughs> fooled everybody except for the umpire. Um, Snyder thought that was a strike. The pitcher thought that was a strike, and unfortunately that's the way it goes sometimes. Foul ball back to, towards us in the grandstand here at MIT Ballpark. So Snyder, he's uh, extending the at-bat now, has to, has to keep going there. Yeah, he's definitely started to settle in the last three or four weekends. I think getting comfortable with his timing and he's hit a couple of long balls for us, definitely has some power, plays in the middle infield, but 
Um, he's moved up in the lineup, and I really like where he's at. He definitely knows what he's doing with the bat up there, and you can tell he's got a little bit of an approach in what he's trying to do. But he really likes getting those arms extended and a lot of pull power over towards the dare shake out there on the pole. There are plenty of people hoping that gets hit tonight. We'll explain that <laughs> later. Swings through, climbs the ladder. That's just the classic work for the pitcher to get a batter to just chase the high ball on, on a big count. Especially him. With his fastball, sometimes guys like to walk a guy off the plate, go further away or further in. He likes to pitch up. So he throws that fastball, then throws that fastball, and then rides that one. It looks so enticing to a hitter, but they just can't ever catch up to it. And Steve's a guy who's played plenty of minor league ball. There's a few of uh, his teammates as well in there. Great combination, pitcher-catcher combination, uh, Kent and Robbie Perkins. Uh, Massey has just set the world on fire at first base. Francoso with a huge average as well, up in the high 300s uh, over there at shortstop. Uh, we'll come back to the question for that in a moment as we now see uh, Nick Taniello. We have not seen a lot of. Uh, only, uh, I think, four at-bats last week and yet to get bat on ball. Yeah, he had a couple of balls, drove a couple of balls last weekend that were right at, guys. So he's got a short, compact swing and not knowing much about hitting, but guys that have quick swings like that you know, can catch up to anything. They don't have to do too much with their timing or make sure their foot's down. He can just take his hands right to the ball. So you're throwing against the Cavalry on Saturday night. That'll be a fascinating affair yourself for the, for the Tuatara show to Imanaga as we see uh, it'll bounce a couple of times before it's picked up by Francoso. Should be a comfortable play. Massey had to reach a little bit and gets the out. So three up, three down. Uh, we'll come back and talk some more about what you're expecting and how you're preparing for that Saturday night game uh, in a moment. But with half an inning in the books, there's no score here. Auckland versus Canberra. With that thing. Have you tried the great yeah, I've tried it all. Okay. So who are you backing in this game? With their three-point shooting. Guys, relax. I got this. Don't want to miss a second of the action this season? With Tabs Basketball Live Vision, you can stream games and access exclusive previews for free anytime, anywhere. Oh! 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 Don't splash the box. Yeah, don't splash the box. Who are you backing this NBA season? Tab. Download the app today. Heading into the bottom of the first, uh, Auckland did not score in the top half. Canberra, though, we're looking to get some runs on the board. And, uh, well, he's been named as the team captain, the club captain for this year. Robbie Perkins last week was absolutely on fire. 4.44, four from nine. Some nice numbers. Josh Colmenter. Yeah, definitely. That's the only thing that's tricky about this league is you have all those days in between where you're not playing and you have to try to maintain that momentum, whether as a pitcher or obviously as a hitter. And, you know, when you're hitting like that, you want to play every single day because you want to go out there and you're in a comfortable comfortable groove and you don't want to have to take that break. But, um, you know, you never know what you're going to get out of them coming out this. Conversely, if you're going bad, you probably love the break because it gives you a little chance to get things settled, work in the cage, whatever you have to do, and be ready to go at it the next weekend. Jimmy Boyce, the right-handed pitcher. Uh, tell us about him. You've given us a little insight, but let's go a bit deeper. Yeah, he... Pitches exclusively out of the stretch. Played a couple years of junior college in the States and is just coming off of that. So you know, he's rather fresh with facing pretty decent competition. And he's been the guy going out there the first game for us uh, pretty much every week. Uh, young Kiwi kid. Definitely knows what he's doing out there. Has a good three-pitch mix. Or three pitch mix and um, you know, attacks guys with the fastball but likes pitching backwards too. So you'll see a lot of dumping in first pitch curveball sliders for a strike and then try to take that out of the zone. Pitching backwards. There's a line I haven't heard in quite some time. <laughs> and Michael Francoso on the subject of swinging at the first pitch. He likes the look of that. Sends it deep into right centre. Francoso started the game with 16 hits uh, and two doubles. He now has 17 hits for the season. And let's make that three doubles. Does it easy. That's uh, a good start for him. Let's see what he does here. Yeah, a lot of times you're just going to get a first pitch fastball, usually, you know, middle, middle away, just the pitcher trying to get a strike. And if you're comfortable swinging at the first pitch, it might be the best pitch you see all night. I think that might have been what Jenkins was trying to do there in the top half of the first. And he was able to take advantage of that in the bottom half. Is it a trend that you think we're seeing more of in baseball, first pitch of the game, guys really trying to 
chase after that first pitch, the very first pitch of the game, whereas in days gone by, you were always coaching. You know, take that first pitch as Cam Warner does take the first pitch low and away. Absolutely. I think the philosophy switched. You used to want to work at bats, take as many pitches as you can, try to get into a team's bullpen. Teams are kind of going away from that now. So it's if you want to jump on the first pitch um, or a 3-0 pitch, feel free that you don't have to work at bats and you know, try to get six or seven pitches and work up the guy's pitch count. So it's definitely changing. You're seeing baseball change in a lot of different ways. And does that make a change for you as a pitcher in, in your mentality? I'll get your thoughts on that as a se in a second as we see Warner take the 1-1 pitch from Jimmy Boyce. Jimmy throwing a lot of fastballs, which – Typically, he likes throwing, mixing in the curveball, and he'll mix stuff in right from pitch one. So, working a little bit different. Obviously, having one start against the Calvary already probably wants to do some things different than he did the last time. That one gets fouled back. But yeah, back to your question. You can use a hitter's aggressiveness against him, especially if you have some at bats and you know that he likes to jump all over the first pitch. And a lot of hitters really like to go first couple of pitches because they don't want to get to an off-speed pitch, a change-up, a slider, a curveball, whatever it is, they want to hit the fastball. And so you can use that to their advantage, too, where you just throw them, like I said, pitching backwards, and you throw them your off-speed stuff first and then maybe throw them a fastball out of the zone where they're so eager to see it that they might swing. Warner takes the 2-2. Two -two. It gets it through the gap. Snyder can't get a hand on it, so Jenkins comes around from center. And so, so he's quick, but he's nobody's that quick. You're not going to get through from <laughs> second to home on that. Yeah, especially having to hold up. You did a good job freezing on that line drive to make sure he didn't get doubled off. And if you have to go back or hold right there, it's going to be tough to score unless that ball's down the line. Gee, a lot of traffic to get that through. He had, <laughs> yeah. had his own teammate, the shortstop, the umpire, everyone got through the lot. Yeah, but that's that um, slider right there. That was the first one we've seen from Jimmy. And if he can start honing that in, that's when he really is successful because he can get steal a first pitch strike with that, but then also be able to throw it for a swing and miss or you know, weak contact. Now the scouting report said about Jimmy Boyce that he needs to stay in the moment, needs to get in the moment. This this is a real challenge for him now, isn't and, it? Yeah, and that's typically what happens for a pitcher is they either start fast like we saw with Kent and then maybe wane as the game goes on, or sometimes... Guys just have trouble feeling it in the first inning or the second inning, getting the rhythm, getting comfortable. Maybe the pitches aren't quite working, and then they get better as it goes. Typically, pitchers are one or the other, but a lot of times you'll feel all the different ones. That's gone a long, long way. Just falls inside, but it'll score one. May score two because Warner's quick, but Warner holds it third. We've got another double in there. This one goes to right field. Massey, we didn't even get a chance to introduce him. Craig Massey comes in and just does this. Yeah, he jumped all over that first pitch. It was a changeup. Um, you know, right there, maybe you beat him with the fastball, but wanted to go with the changeup there. And sometimes throwing too many strikes or throwing all your pitches for strikes helps the hitter out because they know the ball's going to be around the zone. It's just a matter of their timing and what pitch they're going to get. So there's already a conversation out there on the bump. Now, what would you say? This is mainly just to calm him down, slow everything down. When runners get on base, especially early in the game like this, when you really haven't found your footing out there, the game can speed up on you. And pitchers will talk about that, hitters will talk about that. And it's just a way to step back, take a breather, come up with a plan of attack, what you want to do. Obviously with second and third and nobody out, um, you, know, you can't get a double play here. You want to try to do something where you get weak contact, a ground ball, something in the infield, infield pop-up. Um, even in this point, if you get a fly ball, get an out and give up a run. Um, but you want to get outs here, and especially if you can get outs without having to trade runs for them. Um, give your team you know, a chance to dig out of a one or a two-nothing lead as opposed to letting this inning get out of, the, get out of hand. Well, runners at two and three, so the double play really out of the equation at the moment. And in comes Zach Wilson. This guy's just been hot all season. 3-11, he comes in 28 hits so far for the year. And he just keeps hitting and hitting and hitting. And a lot of extra base hits in there as well. Yeah, he mixed in a couple of those against us as well. And that's where Jimmy does well right there, throwing that. That was a lot more sharp. He threw the first one in for a strike, tried to get that one to take. So if he can get a feel for that pitch right there, um, then be able to use his fastball where he can spot it up, he's going to have some success. The good news for, uh, if you like, 
is that Wilson with a regular average of 311, with runners in scoring position, it comes down a smidgen down to 292. <laughs> so, you know, if, if there's good news anywhere, it's there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, you'd rather it go that way than up to, you know, 400 or something. <laughs> Some guys just have a knack for hitting with guys in scoring position. Obviously, hitting in the cleanup spot, he's going to get more opportunities than not with guys on base. I like what I'm seeing from Boyce here. He's, he's not leaving, leaving any sitting up. There's nothing staying up. He's working the bottom edge of the zone. He's just staying down, staying down, which against this cavalry lineup is really important. Espe yeah, especially here. You want to try to get him to hit the ball on the ground. We're playing infield back, so you're going to give up an out for a run. And you know, right there, that's a good pitch. But that's what he does really well with the fastball, is from his arm slot to be able to go in and out at the bottom of the zone. That's what he does well. And you don't see him miss up very often unless it's you know really with off speed. He's got the full count here. Yeah, Wilson likes it. It goes a long way back. Brown goes a long way back but well he may as well uh, get the step ladder and climb the fence because that is G-O-N-E gone. Cavalry put three on the board courtesy of a big jack to right field from Zach Wilson. Warner comes home. Massey comes home. Zach Wilson gets the low five, and there's the high five. One, two, and three. He's ambidextrous on the high fives. Uh, that's a really good start. Let's just check out how he brings up three more runs for the home team. Yeah, in that situation, you definitely don't want to walk a guy, you know, load the bases with nobody out. So he went right after him with a fastball, and if he hit a couple of those against us where, you know, a lot of times you see right-handers will pull power, but he hit a couple opposite field against us as well, and you never like that, but now you know, nobody on. Hopefully, boys can settle in here, and you know maybe go back to that game plan he was planning on starting with. Well, this is the reset now, isn't it? This yeah, you have to. You have to, you know, think of that that it never happened, and now you're pitching just to get outs and get outs quick, get back to the dugout, and you know give your team a chance. But you know, as a starting pitcher, there's nothing better than a one-two-three inning. Sit down in the watch the bottom part of the first inning and get a couple run lead to go out there. David Candelis uh, has not had a season to remember his numbers way down compared to previous years. We might have a look at those numbers a, a bit later on, but uh, he, he's still a class act. 109 he comes in this season, just the six hits, but that's from I think 55 at bats. And he's only got 14 strikeouts, so he's got bat on ball, he's hit the ball into play an awful lot, but it, it it's the unwritten rule, hit him where they ain't, and, and he just hasn't been able to do that. So frustration, but you know, you, you know he's, you're still up against a class player, and now with a 2-2 count, big moment for Boyce. Yeah, baby. He's yeah. been really sharp with the fastball, but that was another curveball right there. Um, you know, much like the second at-bat of the game, that curveball just stays over the zone, and he's able to you know, pull a solid line drive into the left side. But there's such a fine line between, you know, that sweeping across curveball slider where, you know, it gets some depth, drops in for a strike or takes it out of the zone as opposed to it, you know, staying up just enough where a guy can reach out and hook that ball into left field. So in now Robbie Perkins. And does it start to play with your head now as, as a pitcher? You've given up hits to the first five guys you face and then in comes a guy and your scouting report would say, you know, yeah, and then by the time you get to Robbie Perkins, he's hot. He's he went four for nine last week. He's got uh, three big bombs. Yeah, that's... Uh, that mound can become an island in a hurry and you feel like whatever pitch you have, the hitter's going to have an answer for. Uh, you just have to really dig down and trust in your stuff and trust that if you keep throwing strikes and making pitches, that you're going to get some outs and... You could have an outing like that the next time where all those pitches you throw right there end up in outs. It's crazy how baseball works, but uh, you just got to stay with your stuff, stay within yourself, and keep making pitches. And that's where the mental, the mental aspect really starts getting in, where you're searching, you're reaching, you turn into a thrower more than a pitcher, and you're just trying to do anything you can to, to get pitches. Let, let's Let's go through that just a little bit longer uh, you talk about being a thrower more than a pitcher 
this is something that I, I hear a lot of pitchers talk about. Explain that. Yeah, there's times where, you know, when you can pitch, you just go out there and you're, I want this in, I want this up, I want curveball here, and you're actually pitching. And there's times where you just cannot find the strike zone or something like this happens where they're uh, hitting almost everything you're throwing, and you start trying to place the ball. Oh, if I could place it here, he's going to get out. Or if I could place it there, and it takes away a lot of the effectiveness of your stuff because when you're throwing it and pitching it and finishing exactly how you want, that's what gives you your movement or the life on the ball they talk about. And when you become just a thrower, uh, everything kind of slows down a little bit. You become flat, and um, it's more than likely going to end in you know disaster because like that you just throw four balls all over the place. See here he's coming, coming right after him, and this is what he needs to do. You almost have that I don't care attitude. I'm just going to throw these. I'm going to throw them as hard as I can. I'm going to give them everything that I've got. And, you know, at some point they have to hit it at somebody. Oh, right at the umpire is probably not who you were intending to <laughs> hit it at. <laughs> exactly. But, I mean, you, you can see there the last couple of pitches, the emphasis and uh, the aggressiveness has been a lot better. Where he's trying to get in there on his hands, maybe try to get him to hit a ground ball to the shortstop. And if you could trade... Um, two outs with one pitch here, it would go a long way into getting you out of the inning and you know keeping Jimmy Boyce in for the next three or four. I reckon those last two pitches from Boyce, the two fastest pitches he's thrown, the two hottest fastballs he's thrown for the night. It might be just the based off of his mechanics and then his body language. I think he's to the point now where he's just in, you know, I don't care attack mode. I'm coming at you and. You know, hope sometimes that's what you need is just a mentality change, and that'll do wonders for you. But even that, that was one of the best you know, sliders he's thrown right there. Laid off it, but you know that was a lot better than the ones he's thrown before. So Scotty Cohn up in the bullpen. He's a man who is very, very familiar with this ballpark. Uh, used to play for the Cavalry yep. a few years back. Uh, and for mine, put together one of the best complete games ever thrown in this ballpark. Okay. Uh, this will be a challenge for our, for our stats team to see if they can dig it up. There was a game that Scott Cohn threw here, a one-hitter, uh, on a stinking hot day, actually. Fairly similar conditions now, but it was an afternoon game against Sydney. I think it was 2016. One-hitter uh, and one strikeout in a complete game shutout of the Sydney Blue Sox. We'll see if they can dig up some details on that before the end of the game because it looks like Cone will be coming in fairly soon. But now we've got a full count uh, on on Carl Perkins. And, and right now, Boyce can't buy anything. Those last two sliders that he's thrown, really good pitches just off the plate. And you almost get an offer, but you don't quite. And so now you're in a 3-2 count again. He's walked two in a row. This really is turning into a nightmare. This it, is. it is. This is, you know, you think you can control it. You think it won't ever happen. Same thing, you know, with bases loaded and nobody out. You don't think you're ever going to get in that situation. And lo and behold, the next thing you know, you might find yourself in that. And, you know, from everything that's happened in this game, I think Jimmy thought, all right, let's reset. Let's get some outs here. Never again, never in his wildest dreams, he think that he'd be bases loaded, no outs after giving up four runs already. He's given up five hits and then walked two in a row to load the bases again. Now has Logan Kingham. And here at the bottom of the out of the order, you have to go right at him. But at, conversely, I'm sure they're thinking, like, everybody else is getting a hit. You know, why can't we? So hopefully you get him to swing at some pitches out of the zone, get him to hit a pitch to somebody. If you could get a double play here, it would be huge. But it's also tough because he's been out there for, it's got to be getting close to 30 pitches. and. Typically, once you get to like 30, 35, that's about the most a lot of managers will let you throw in an inning because you really never get, I mean, you throw bullpens and stuff and you'll throw a lot, but it's completely different than throwing all those in a game scenario. And, and you can see he's starting to tire here, can't you? The arm's starting to just not go where he wants it to go. You talked a bit before about the throwing instead of pitching. Yeah. You can, you're starting to see that now. It's really happening. Yeah, it's tough to stay on it and pitch and really pitch 35 pitches in a row in game situation in high stress atmosphere like runners on um, you know no outs and, and let's that's not forget what he's it's to really do. hot today yeah, too you know it is seriously yeah. hot and that 
accompanied into it as well. It's a recipe for a recipe for disaster. If we could get him out at home, into first. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> that's. Oh, just what, what? What do you do there? You know, that's where finally you get the relief for Boyce. You get the relief for Boyce, and then that a simple throwing error up the first baseline. That's just inexperience, I think, more than anything else. Yeah, I mean, Richards makes a good play, gets the out at home. And then it's a good throw. I don't know if he loses oh. it in the he's sun. He's lost in the sun. Yeah. Um, he's also typically an outfielder. He doesn't play a lot of first base, so you know, that could factor in too. Um, this is a classic situation where he's got sunglasses on his hat and loses a ball in the sun. Uh, it happens oh, now he a puts million him on. times, and so now he puts them on. <laughs> he's he's yeah. got the earpiece in. He's heard you talk about uh, yeah, that. That's exactly right. And now he's taking them off again. Uh, that, uh, yeah, so with, uh, with on that era, uh, that's the last we'll see of Jimmy Boyce. Oh, uh, gee, that's not going to do his numbers any good at all, but uh, it should be Scott Cohn coming in. We'll go through some details on him uh, coming in in the first inning, uh, and we'll have a look back at that game that I mentioned from 2016 as well. We've dug out some numbers there as we have a borrow call to the bullpen. We'll give you some more details on that soon, but right now uh, it's all for the home team. Canberra leading 5 nothing with just one out in the bottom of the first. A borrel call to the bullpen uh, far earlier than anyone from Auckland would have watched. And apologies to our Sky TV audience over there that you've had to catch a, 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 well, two pitches in the first inning. Doesn't happen too often. But here's a man who knows what to do in this ballpark. We'll come back to an, an amazing performance from January 2016. But give us the scouting report on Scotty Cohn. Yeah, Scott's a guy that they've actually contemplated making a start. So this will give him a chance to do that. Um, he, as a lefty, he throws a little more smooth than a lot of times you'll get. Sometimes lefties have a little bit of goofiness to them, uh, maybe an angle, but he throws kind of over the top. Um, you know, good fastball, big curveball over the top, change up. Throws a lot of strikes, and um, you know, he's pitched in a lot of situations, a lot of times against lefties, but he's not a traditional, like, left-on-left -left specialist. He's more of a left-handed starting pitcher where he can throw pitches to righties and lefties he's going to get a lot of opportunities here as he's going to be called upon to throw a handful of innings change in direction for the cavalry although it won't matter so much for this man Koki Oyagi who hasn't faced anybody but it'll be up to the top of the batting order uh, very very soon so let, let's go through Scott Cohn's mechanics at this point because we've got a lefty to get used to now yeah he throws um, like I said a lot more traditional for a lefty he's a little more over the top. A lot of times you see lefties, especially if they're a reliever, they may be out to the side of three-quarter, low three-quarter angle. But he's a little more over the top, a little more conventional. Um, good pitch mix, just knows how to pitch. Uh, throws all his pitches for strikes. And he's built a lot more like a starting pitcher. We just don't have a luxury to have too many lefties. So he's been in the bullpen for us just to give us, you know, maybe a little bit of that left-on-left -left matchup. Let's have a look at... Cone. There's nothing wrong there, is there? No, it's it's good. He's he's smooth. He's got good mechanics. Um, like I said, he's a little more of an up and over kind of catapult pitcher as opposed to uh, swinging out in front, a little more rotational pitcher um, like you're typically probably used to. Puts one in the dirt and catcher does well there. Really yeah, Jerry's, or as we call him, Cowboy, has a lot of experience back there. He, he's played you know, four years of college ball. He's played over here uh, a little bit playing some of the club ball. So there's probably no pitcher, no 
pitch that he hasn't handled before. And he moves well back there. Uh, Yagi with the grounder, short, second, and out, but only able to get the one again, unable to turn the double play. He, uh, that's the situation where as a pitcher, you do everything right, you get him to hit a ground ball, and he just doesn't hit it hard enough. I mean, like if you could have, you know, just hit a typical two-hop ground ball, that's probably a double play, but instead he has to charge in and get it. And he still gets the out at second, so it keeps the easy play in effect, but unfortunately for that, a double play would have saved another run from crossing. Just got a little confusion here. We've got six nothing on our score, and we've got six nothing on the scoreboard. But we've got six nothing on the stats. I think they've got to go and uh, unpick stuff in the computer there. So uh, we'll have to rely on uh, the old-fashioned pen and paper for a <laughs> few numbers here. And our our stats guru Nina Zinnerman is doing a great job of of relying on the the, the pen and paper as well. So. Trust us, 6 nothing at the moment, as we see now Ayagi. He's quick, by the way, in, in the background. And, oh, oh, this may do some more damage. Ayagi will get around. So what's happened here? It's just come out of the end of the fingers. Yeah, by the looks the, of it. yeah this is... It looks like it just slips out of his hand. You know, probably some type of uh, curveball or slider. And on a hot day like this, you're going to get a lot of moisture on your hand as he goes to the rosin bag now to fix that, but you know, Scott needs to get out of this inning, let himself you know, re recoup, shut down, and be able to go out there in a clean inning, but you know, he's probably trying to figure it out too, as you don't really expect sitting down on the bullpen to get called on in the bottom of the first inning. There's a good pitch. Well, Francoso, it's his second time at the plate tonight, double to center to start things off with the very first pitch for the Cavalry. So really bonus batting for Francoso. He's got nothing to lose here now with two out and just one on. Not at all, yeah. And I, he probably hasn't faced Scott before, so you see him being a little more patient. And a lot of times you'll get that out of a hitter facing a pitcher for the first time. And the same with a pitcher facing a hitter for the first time. You, Move the ball around, try to see what he's going to do, what he's going to offer at. And Scott's put himself in a good situation to get out of the inning here. Oh, good stop dirty. on a slider in the dirt there. Lacoyo doing well with the with the body behind the ball there. If if nothing else, it's it's the it's the fundamental for the catcher. If you can't get a glove on it, get something behind it and just stop the thing. Yeah, he does a good job of. I mean, if you keep the ball in front of you, it gives you a chance to make a play wherever it is. And, He's done really well at that. We talked a lot about the impact of so many runs on the starting pitcher, on Jimmy Boyce, who will have a line that he probably won't want to look at ever again. But let's just flip it for a minute. Uh, what impact on, on this Canberra Cavalry side that... As Francesa fouls first base side again. What impact on this Canberra Cavalry side that really has been struggling to hit and get hits in groups to suddenly come out and, and just light up the board with, with hit after hit after hit from the first five? Yeah, I mean, it sets the tone not only for the game but for the weekend too. And you see a lot of these hitters being aggressive and getting pitches that they can handle. And we're able to put some good swings on them. But at the same time, we're able to take their singles and not do too much with it. But as a pitcher now, you go out there and you get handed a 6 nothing lead. I mean, you're just 100% in attack mode. Well, that's got eyes. Goes straight up the line. This will be another run for the Cavalry because Ayagi, I mentioned, is super quick, and he's already home. He's home before that ball's been picked up. So he has motored from second, and Francoso gets his 10th RBI for the season. Not bad for a leadoff guy when he uh, only played half a season. He's had 16 hits <laughs> and 10 RBIs. Not at all, yeah. And I mean, he probably wants to get up there and hit as many times as you can when you're feeling like you like he probably is. You, know, you wish you could probably hit every single inning. Um, unfortunately, you know, good pitch there, but in a 3-2 count, and he just goes with it, slaps it the other way, and you know, gets it inside the third baseline there, and you know, standing on second for the second time this inning. Two doubles in the first inning for a game. Not been done often in the Australian League. Cam Warner uh, comes in to bat for his second time after a single to centre field previously. 
The Cavalry now with a 7 nothing lead here. Yeah, typically the hardest three outs to get are in the ninth inning, but for Auckland, unfortunately, it's been in the first inning here. Is they just cannot get anything to go right for them. Well, that's in the dirt. Goes away from the catcher, and Francoso, well, he's able to jog that 90 feet and advances to third. So just about everything that can go wrong has gone wrong here. This has just been the, the one card's come out and the whole house of cards is just falling That's around. That's exactly right. So, and who, who's going to come out and turn this <laughs> around? What, you know, who, who can the, the, the Tuatara rely on at this point? There's, we have a couple of vocal leaders, um, you know, some guys that have been around, but a lot of us are, or a lot of the team is young. But there's a few guys. Um, Zach Clark's a guy that's been able to rally some of the guys together. But um, I think the manager that they have, you know, calling the shots tonight um, is a really good job of, you know, going with the pulse of the game and what guys need to hear. And, um, you know, he won't let this team quit and they won't quit. And it's just a matter of picking one another up. And you, know, you just want to get out of this inning and you know, see what you can do going forward. And um, that's the only good thing about giving up a lot of runs in the first inning is you still have eight at-bats to try to chip away. And if you just stick with that mentality and you can start getting some outs on the mound, you know, next thing you know, if you're looking at a 7-3 game, then maybe a 7-4 game, and that's really all you can hope for right now. Hard yeah, hit straight to second base, and Taniello easily gets the ball across to Guian Chu, and... Well, I think that's about 54, maybe 55 pitches. It's a very, very long haul in the bottom of the first. The Cavalry, they put up a crooked number. They lead by seven runs to nothing as we head into the second here at MIT Ballpark. It's too hot for the fans to dance. The mascot's up, and this man, I think, will now have his tail well and truly up. Steve Kent has plenty of insurance backing him up. Let's have a bit of a sticky beak at what he's got for us across the course of the season. Yeah, there's that. He loves fastballs. I mean, he attacks hitters with fastballs. You see a lot of fastballs up out of the zone, fastball down and in there. This is on about the worst weather baseball's been played <laughs> in in this country. This was a couple of weeks ago in Adelaide. It was cold, it was windy, it was driving rain. And he was just lights out, but he's done it time after time after time across the course of this season. Yeah, and even in that weather, you want a pitcher that attacks, throws a lot of strikes, goes after him. Because hitters don't like hitting in that weather. And if they do, they're usually up there, you know, try to get the at-bat over as soon as possible. The defense doesn't want to be out there. So a guy that can throw a lot of strikes and he throws a lot of fastballs. And in a situation like this, handed a 7 nothing lead. Uh, he's just going to be rearing back and coming right at guys and just, you know, see what the Tuatara can do. Well, let's go to the batting lineup again. Uh, Daniel Lamb Hunt, a man who's no stranger to fans of the Australian Baseball League, to be followed by Max Brown and Chris Richards. You talked about chipping away. That's what... Uh, th that's now the secret here for, for Auckland. Seven runs is not insurmountable. It just... You don't want to try and get eight in one dig. You've, you've got eight innings left here. You've got plenty of time to work at it. Exactly. And for each hitter, they have to stay within their you know, mind frame, what they do, what they do well, and just continue to put together good at-bats. And here you see Lamb Hunt take two fastballs. And like we, we thought, Kent was just going to go right after him with these fastballs. So as, as a pitcher here, you do you think, well, I've got a chance to really slam the door? Or, or do you think, well, I've got a chance here. I've got plenty of insurance. I can try some stuff that I've been wanting to try. Uh, particularly in this inning, you want to slam the door shut. With a team that's hitting like that, you give up seven runs. And a lot of pitching coaches will talk about shutdown innings. 
where after the team scores a run, you go out there, put up a zero, get the team back in the dugout. That's what he wants to do here. And then as he goes, you know, he has the liberty to maybe go go after some stuff, try some things um, as the game goes along, and he can work on that. But right now, he just wants to get that team back into the dugout as quick as, they, as he can. And once again, he climbs the ladder with that fastball and gets a check swing here. Lamb Hunt. Well, it was a strike either way, wasn't it? Yeah, it looked like it. You know, we haven't really seen too many called strikes here to get the umpire's zone, but... Um, you know, we saw one curveball in that at bat, but all the rest were fastballs, and I think the rest of the two Atara can expect much of the same. Picked up by Kingham and easily across to Massey, the 4-3 to three play for Max Brown, who, well, he's faced just the one pitch tonight, not as successfully as some of his uh, his opposition, but not afraid to go after uh, after Stephen Kent. Kent coming into tonight, by the way, I mentioned this earlier, uh, 37 point one innings pitched coming into tonight and 39 strikeouts that's that's the that's the barometer if you've got more strikeouts than innings pitched you're doing you're doing all right yeah and you know that you can get yourself out of a tough situation with a strikeout and you have that luxury and i would assume most of his most of his strikeouts are on that fastball right there as we saw from the from the clip to open up the inning but it's kind of a double edged sword here with him being a fastball pitcher and wanting to throw fastballs to the Tuatara knowing that and trying to be able to take advantage of it. But, you know, like Max did there, you're going to get a fastball. You know, if you put a good swing on it, it could go somewhere. But if not, you're not going to really tire him out anymore. And you see him go to two curveballs here. He might know that Richards really likes hitting fastballs. That's, I don't know if there's a fastball out there that you can get by this guy, but Kent might know that as he went to two breaking balls there. It's ahead in the count here. Just looking to work low and away. Yeah, and you know it's tough to get beat that way, especially with two outs here. You can kind of go at him. Thought he spotted up that fastball right there. Let's see what he goes with here, 2-2. Two, two. Stays low. And this is the only thing the two Atara can do is you know, continue to put together good at bats. You see some pitches if he's going to throw them wide and try not to miss him when he throws them over to the plate. Richards facing the full count from Steve Kent. And the count will remain full. Tuatara really need to get Richards on base here. Need to just extend the inning a little bit. Give give the fielders just a chance to recuperate uh, yeah. a little bit after that really long Exa first Yeah, to make it seem like they're not just only playing defense. Richards putting... In putting together a good at bat and you can tell he's he's played a, what's impressive about him is he's been more on the coaching side the last three or four years hasn't really played too much baseball especially at this type of competition and he's jumped in like he just got done you know playing over overseas somewhere once the season started put him at any position put him in the lineup and he's been impressive to watch play Look at the pop flight plenty of competition for it and in the end, it's Massey takes care of it, wandering in from first base. The pop fly free, pop flight to three, wraps things up as uh, we have now one and a half in the books, and it is seven nothing to the home side for the Canberra Cavalry. It'll be Massey, Wilson, and Candlest due up next. See this. This is what you mean to us. No, seriously. Why? Because we see greatness in you. It's right there, inside, just waiting to be discovered. And we should know, because we're number one too. Number one in the ACT for full-time employment, for starting salary, for student support, and learning resources. Yep, all the things that matter. So even though we're number one, you're still number one to us. Might sound corny, but hey, it's 100% true. Seven nothing for the Canberra Cavalry heading into the bottom of the second inning here. Uh, Jimmy Boyce copped some rough treatment as the starter, and then that continued. A lot of it coming at the hands of this man, Michael Francoso. Uh, well, Cam Warner, actually, we've got there as he goes around to centre field, and then this is what Francoso did. 
He went right or right centre and then left field. Plenty of action in the outfield with uh, a double to centre, a single to centre, a double to uh, right, a single to uh, left, and a double to left. So plenty of work for the outfielders in that first inning. But this man, he's not afraid to throw a lot of pitches, Scott Cohn. And he's got uh, Craig Massey, Zach Wilson, and David Candler's coming up. I mentioned when we saw him warming up in the bullpen before uh, that there was a game that he threw here when he was playing for the Canberra Cavalry, January 17, 2016 it was. And the box score from it is is truly remarkable. It was against the Sydney Blue Sox. And the, the Blue Sox were completely blanked, 5 nothing. It was, from memory, a very hot Sunday afternoon here in Canberra. I'm just trying to find out the weather. I wasn't that hot, 26 degrees and sunny. But Cohn, the only man used by the Cavalry that afternoon. I'll give that line in a moment as he pitches to Massey. He's found the zone now. Threw 121 pitches that day. 68 of them for strikes. But the line reads, nine innings pitched, one hit, no runs, obviously. Only walked three. And he really is on. He's, he's set now. He's had a chance to get his head in the game. But that day, one strikeout. Pitched a complete game shutout with one strikeout. 18 ground outs and five flights. It was the best fielding performance I've seen by a team, I think, ever in this league. It was phenomenal. I would say so, uh, especially when you throw out he threw 68 strikes out of 121 pitches. Uh, wildly effective for sure. That's typically not a break that you would see with a guy throwing a complete game shutout and only giving up one hit. But um, sometimes you just have everything working for you, and any time you throw a pitch up there, they're going to hit it right at somebody. Is He's able to get the lead off out, and that's huge right here. Try to get the team back in the dugout, get back to hitting, and it looks like he's much more settled and you know, going out there with a fresh inning and getting to do his own thing as opposed to coming in with runners on. It's going to make it a lot easier for Scott. So he's a man that a lot of fans, has a lot of fans here in the, in, in the capital, uh, came to Canberra uh, to do his university studies, playing for the Cavalry at that stage. Uh, and from talking to him in New Zealand a few weeks ago, and I'm not sure whether you had a chance to have a conversation with him about it, Josh, but was more or less ready to walk away from the game. The, the, the two Tuatara, he's qualified, qualified as a New Zealander uh, due to his parentage, his family. The Tuatara came along at just the right time for this man, and it, it's sparked his interest in playing the game again. And I can honestly say he was happier than I've seen him in a long, long, long time when I saw him in Auckland a few weeks ago. Uh, great teammate. Yeah, he really is. And we keep joking you know, with him with his studies and being a physio. We had one travel with us for the first part of the season when we were in Auckland, and now we've just been kind of getting local guys. But keep joking that he should just do double duty and be a left-handed <laughs> pitcher and then work on the guys before and after the game. Well, Wilson got the walk the first time, uh, the home run the first time. He's got the easier 90-foot uh, jog after getting to the base on balls courtesy of uh, Scott Cohn and well, the traffic up that first baseline just continues to flow. Like the traffic reporting a wee bit later on. Uh, but with one on, one out, it's now David Candlis. And Candlis hasn't had a huge season so far. He's just had seven hits, but let's see what he's got as he takes the first pitch high and inside. Yeah, and this is where Scott just has to keep attacking them. You know, get that guy to hit your pitch and Hopefully it's a ground ball here. You can turn two, get somewhat of a quick inning, and you know, give the team a chance to get some more at-bats. Hard hitting again. Candlas finds the gap. Back-to-back -back hits for David Candlas with a single to right center, and Zach Wilson advances to second base. So, again, it's runners at one and two, but you talked about it before, turning two. This is a chance now. There's a, there's a, a, a big chance for the double play here now. It's a double play open. There's an out at third, second, or first. Yeah, and you have to try to take advantage of that. You want to, especially now having to come in in the first inning, you try to throw as many innings as you can, try to save, you know, what few bullpen guys are down there, especially in this four-game series. And so you definitely want to be efficient. Robbie Perkins uh, batting now. Got a walk previously. That uh, hit for David Candelis, his second for the game, and... Just shows how, how much of a, a tough ask it's been for him this season. It's just his second multi-hit game for the year, and we're well into uh, into the 20s now in terms of games played. That's a, that, that shows that he's really had a challenging year. Hasn't given up, hasn't affected his, him, him mentally. Still the same guy, but just really, really had to, to answer a lot of questions. 
and maybe tonight will be his night. Yeah, and just in his approach, he went up there and didn't try to do too much, was able to hit the ball the other way. There's a few of the guys in the Calvary lineup that have done that. Sometimes, you know, in basketball, a shooter, sometimes a layup is the, what really turns them around, and, you know, just hitting a ball to right field might be the layup of hitting, and that might be just what you need, a couple of those, and then you know, things start feeling a little more normal, a little more comfortable as that pitch gets to the backstop, and, you know, that's the stuff right there that goes unnoticed in the – goes unnoticed in any stat book or anything like that that happens. But all of a sudden that goes from runners at first and second. You got a chance for a double play. Now you have two runners in scoring position and one out. And your whole mentality as a pitcher you know, kind of changes. You go from you're trying to get a double play, trying to force it to now, you know, you're trying to keep that at just a 7 nothing lead. Bit of sweat on the hands there, I reckon, for Cone. You see, see him come off the back <laughs> of the mound and just gra grab the rosin bag and give it a good squeeze. Perkins goes fly right. Chasing around Chasing after it is after Brown. Uh, that's just in the corner. Stays fair, and that's more runs. There's two cavalrymen crossing the plate. Candlas was closing in on Wilson on the way home, and Robbie Perkins has made it an easy double to right field as well. So well, it just continues. That takes the cavalry to 9 nothing. That's, I think, their highest score for the season. I don't think the cavalry have passed 7 for the season. I'm going from memory once. We'll double-check that, but certainly the 7... Yeah, and it's yeah. tough for a ball to get over Max's head. You see him tracking it down. He's been great out there. But it's been impressive that the Calvary have done a lot of their damage going the other way. A lot of these right-handed hitters hitting the ball to right field and just going with the pitch. And, you know, that's what happens a lot of times when you're behind in the count consistently is you still have to throw pitches over the plate and you know, it gives the hitter a chance to do what they want to do. And that is confirmed now. This is the most the Cavalry have scored all season. It's been a long time coming. This side won a championship, or this club won a championship in 2013, made it to a championship series last season, had another championship series in 2014, and those seasons were all built off the back of monster run tallies. This year, uh, it, it's, it's been a real knock them down, grind them out, try, try, try to win. It's not you'll score eight, we'll score ten. It's been you'll score six and we won't let you as Kyle Perkins tries to bring his brother around from second. But Kyle, with a little chopper, goes up the third baseline into foul territory. So this, this is foreign territory for the fans here at MIT Ballpark this season. They have not seen this Cavalry side light up the scoreboard like this uh, since last year. Yeah, and hopefully for the tour, it's all right. They get them all out tonight. <laughs> That's what you're hoping is, um, you know, you can... Hopefully now put together some solid innings where you don't give up any runs going forward. Try to quell the offensive momentum that they have and not let it really carry over into the rest of the series. But we need Scott to get an out here as he sets it on this 2-1 pitch. And Kyle Perkins calls for time. A good off-speed pitch change up down and away. And that's what Scott really does well, is he can throw all those pitches and all those pitches for strikes. And that's what he needs to do is start getting some of these hitters off balance where you know, they can't sit back and hit the ball to right or drive the ball. They're hitting it off the end or something just like that. Get them out in front. Nice play there by the shortstop. Good scoop on the other end. Oh, oh he's called them off. Gee, that's tough. <laughs> That is tough. And again, you mentioned that Zhu is more renowned as an outfielder than a first baseman. And just didn't quite look like he got right in terms of position there. We'll, we'll hopefully catch a replay on that, but just really looked like he just struggled. Yeah, I mean, he's probably trying to get the... Had to reach a long way. To scoop the ball and work with the footwork, but, you know, that's a situation where it's a tough play to make all the way around, and we just can't, can't consistently get a... Get a break here for the Tuatar. Everything seems to be going the Calvary's way you know, tonight at their home field. Carl Perkins on. Robbie Perkins at second. And uh, Logan Kingham, after a fielder's choice, his first time at bat, decides this time, no choice about it. Just hit it through the infield. Hit it down the left field line. Get an RBI. Just his fifth RBI for the season. Brings home the club captain. That's always a popular move. Yeah, in this situation, the Calvary are essentially playing with house money. You can go up there, you know, free swinging, relaxed. You know, you don't have to score any more runs, but you can. And you see these guys you know, jumping on pitches over the plate or putting the ball in play and good things are happening. And 
And when you can have that mentality as a as a hitter, when things are relaxed and loose, you know, that's what you're trying to do ideally each time out. And in this situation, you know, one through nine, the Calvary seem to be in that mentality. Just backtracking a little to people scoring along at home. Perhaps Kyle uh, Perkins has been credited as a throwing error from the shortstop there. Just fair enough. As you had done more than enough, I think, in terms of trying to get onto the ball. Yeah, it's, you can't really give him that error there as he's trying to scoop the ball and keep his foot on the bag. But once again, the Tuatar just can't get any breaks. Now, Yagi. Do you reckon the instructions are to really have a go now and, and really swing because Ayagi's had a crack there. Snyder takes the easy pop line, shallow left. Yeah, I think you can be as aggressive as you want here. Um, you know, if you get out on a first pitch, it doesn't really matter. You don't really need to grind and try to get guys on base, put together good at-bats, and maybe slap one somewhere, work a walk. You can go up there and, and just free swing. And right now, any run is, I guess you want to call it insurance runs, but with a 10 nothing lead, you, know, you like to think that's going to be safe, especially with the guy you have on the mound. But, you know, a lot of times in baseball or any sport, you can never really have too many runs or points or whatever it may be. Believe it or not, coming into tonight's game, Auckland had scored more runs across the season than Canberra. They tied it up, and Canberra's now gone ahead in, in the last couple of minutes. So it, it's been quite a turnaround. Yeah, uh, especially. I mean, maybe this team has been looking for an offensive breakout, as the coach said before. They've been working in the cage and trying to get some guys right, and it seemed like it happened last weekend against Geelong. And you know, they've been able to m bridge that, you know, th three-day gap and worked and practiced, and obviously Christmas didn't affect them in, in one single bit. Well, Christmas came early for the Cavalry uh, with a, with a four-game sweep. <laughs> uh, tough task, that uh, series against Geelong last week. The, uh, the scoreboard shows Canberra winning all four of those games, but they came from behind in two of those. Uh, and on the Friday night game, uh, we only got four and a half innings in, and then it came down and someone was building an arc out there <laughs> in the car park. It was absolutely torrential. But uh, and, and that was just when Geelong Korea, they, they put a couple of runs on in the in the bottom of the fourth before Canberra held on to, to the lead. So they got the sweep, but it wasn't an easy sweep. Yeah, that Geelong team, say what you will about their record or anything like that. They have some guys in there that know what they're doing. They're scrappy. In, hit the ball, they put the ball in play, they steal bases, and teams like that are just sometimes tough to beat, tough to play against, because it seems like they're always in the mix, or they can force the action where they're running a lot on the base paths, making you try to make some plays, and um, you know, not an easy team to, to play against, I've, obviously we split with them, but um, you know, a win's a win, it doesn't really matter how you get it. So French Sosa with doubles to center and left so far today, now on a full count. And this is impressive here where you got a 10 nothing lead and you know maybe he sees a couple more RBIs out there as he's worked the count 3-2, put together a good at-bat, um, laid off some tough pitches, and you know now he puts himself in a situation to at least get a pitch he's going to be able to put in play, and you know, hopefully Scott can get a pop-up here, a little roll over ground ball. So, so, sees the ball. Low and outside in the dirt, and he gets the walk, and the bases loaded up again. That's been tough for both two Atara pitchers so far. With the off speed just hasn't quite been as consistent. You know, one time you throw a really good one, the next one in the dirt, or a couple got hung in the first inning that were hit pretty well. And when you're out there working with just maybe one or two pitches, it's you really feel confident and can command. Uh, it makes it for a long day, and you just feel like. You need to do something to trick the hitter, or get him to hit it to somebody, and hopefully that's the case. Pours a strike in there. This is Cam Warner, who, uh, in somewhat of a rarity for the Cavalry, actually hit into an out, a 4-3 to three previously, and had a single to center in his 17th hit of the season earlier. And that's what Scott can do. Getting that first pitch fastball goes change up there. Uh, I mean, any pitcher... That's the recipe is to pitch ahead, but specifically in this situation where you have bases loaded again, you know, one good pitch here, you get out of the inning and prevent any further damage. So the dirt that's got away, there'll be another run scoring here as Kyle Perkins comes home on the wild pitch. And with that dirt as hard as it is, you know, 
the dry conditions and everything, the field's firmed up. Those balls are bouncing like rubber balls almost in front of the plate. As you see this just bounce up and over the catcher, and there's been a few other ones like that. And, and yeah, if your ball gets past the catcher in this park, you're not going to make a play on anybody at home. You know, unfortunately, every runners move up 90 feet and another run in. Been chatting with a couple of pitchers who played against uh, the Tuatara in New Zealand, and they, they said the difference playing in, in on the temporary ballpark you were at earlier this season uh, at home with such a small uh, foul area behind home plate compared to coming back here where there, there, there's you know, there's a sheep paddock here. You, you, you can almost run a small farming <laughs> enterprise around behind home plate and the, and, and, and the safety net. Yeah, we yeah we moved the field. Uh, I think we took everything and just pushed it that way because we had a significant outfield fence. And that series against Calvary, or against the Calvary, particularly on Saturday where the wind was howling out to right, it was pretty much just trying to hit it at the light tower out there and let it curve around the foul pole. And you know, there's a handful of home runs on both sides just hitting it into that jet stream. But it is amazing all the places that you go, places you play. You know, the the dimensions and everything of the park are, are the same, have to be, but just the way it's set up, and it might be shorter one way or more foul territory. Every park has its own nuances that, you know, really helps out the home field. Can Hopefully Warner. Jenkins can get to that. Oh, oh. he's fallen short or may have just gone in and out of the glove, but either way, the ball's on the turf. And two more runs score. And if you know if the game's flip flopped right there, if the two tower hit that, the ball probably hangs up enough for the center fielder to get, or he makes that dive. But Jenkins does everything he can there. Comes motoring in, tries to make the diving play. So that's two RBIs. You would imagine for Cam Warner that'll take him out to ten for the year. But gee, that's just. You know, that's tough. Yeah, I mean, when you're when they're hitting the ball hard, and it's fine in space, and then when they hit the ball soft like that, and it's still fine, you just, you know it's not going to be the, I mean, we knew that from the first inning, but it's continued here into the second. And now Craig Massey, well, he might find himself in trouble at first and does. And uh, he's out on a 4-3 to three play, and that means that well, the Cavalry put seven up in the first and six up in the second. It may be a long night for the visitors. We'll talk about what they can do to uh, try and come back in just a moment as they'll be sending their 7, 8 and 9 hitters to the plate. Right now it is Canberra 13. Auckland yet to score Friday night baseball, Thursday night baseball rather, from Canberra. See this? This is what you mean to us. No, seriously. Why? Because we see greatness in you. It's right there, inside, just waiting to be discovered. And we should know, because we're number one too. Number one in the ACT, for full-time employment, for starting salary, for student support and learning resources. Yep, all the things that matter. So even though we're number one, you're still number one to us. Might sound corny, but hey, it's 100% true. Well, it might be 13 to nil at the moment after two innings here in the nation's capital. But just a few weeks ago, when Canberra made their first trip to play baseball in New Zealand, it was a very different story. It was a very hard-fought series, and it wound up going to two games apiece. What do you what, what, what do you remember, Josh, from from that series? Yeah, the first game, um, you know, we got a run early off of Kent, but then he really settled in, and um, you know, we Jimmy was pitching well. And then, you know, towards the end of the game, um, gave up a couple runs, and then our bullpen gave up. But on that um, on that Saturday, the conditions were tough. It was really only blowing out the right <laughs> field. It was cold. Uh, one of those games where, you know, the scores that show that right there, 3-2 to two and 2-1 two to one seem exactly accurate. It wasn't a day for hitting. And um, probably the best thing about that was in the game that we were able to get the walk-off win in the bottom bottom of the seventh or bottom of the ninth, whichever game it was, the way our fence was constructed out there, the makeshift fence, the ball actually went, went through the fence. Yeah. And uh, as opposed, we thought it was a home run, and unfortunately for Chris Richards, he had a couple RBIs taken off of his 
season total. I hope we can pop that graphic back up again for a second uh, to, because it would be nice to, to just dwell on a moment for the... You know, give, give you a little bit of a wrap there <laughs> in a 9-1 victory to get to get the W. Yeah, that's uh, un yeah. Fortunately, we were able to put up a lot of runs and um, you know just giving up the one, and then our bullpen came in and really threw well. I think I got through five and a third or five and two thirds, and um, you know it was a, s a warm sunny day, and the bats came out. So uh, the two atar can definitely do that, and we've had a couple games where we've you know put it up put up quite a few runs, but for whatever reason, it seems like when one through nine are clicking, everything's going well, but when it's not, it's one through nine. It's not half the team's going and half the team's not. It's it's all or nothing for the, for the most part. I'll say you looked very good that day. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, it was funny. I, I don't. I, I've not watched a lot of games from up uh -huh. the, the first baseline or the third baseline. It was an interesting experience uh, at, at at that temporary ballpark. Looking forward to next season when you when uh, the Tuatara are playing. At, at, at a, a very different home ground, that North Harbour Stadium is going to be a tremendous facility. We might chat about that later on. Let's get to what's going on down there right now with Gui Yuan Zhu, the first baseman. Yeah, he puts together pretty good at bats. He, he has a good eye. He has, a, you know, a, a really good approach and strategy at the plate. Uh, he's got some power, and he'll show it in BP. But uh, this season, for the most part, he's been uh, up the middle, taking his singles, taking what the pitcher gives him. But you know, if he's able to get that pitch. You know, middle, middle in. Um, he's got enough power to hit the ball well out of here. Um, but uh, you can tell that, you know, he's played a little bit. He's in the Orioles organization and he's battled some injuries, I think, for the first part of his career. But you know, sees the fastball there and swings and miss. And I mean, that's he's going to get fastballs. This whole lineup's going to get fastballs. And there's a couple guys in there that can hit fastballs really well. And that's what they need is a couple of those guys to jump on them and just get some runners on base. And, you get him to pitch out of the stretch a little bit. Kent again, just showing remarkable composure on the full count. I mean, it, 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 is it, it's easier with a 13-run cushing, but but at, at the same time, there's got to be. Oh, gee, we're so far ahead. I can sort of switch off a little bit. Yeah, I mean, he's you know that at bat, he got behind a little bit, which he hasn't yet. But uh, he's also sat down for you know 20 minutes between each inning, and you know, sometimes if you're in that groove pitching. You know, you want your team to score runs, but you want them to score them and score them quick so you can get back out there. Those long innings where you have to sit down and then come back out and almost re-get loose, especially two innings in a row, you know, might take its toll on you a little bit, but he's going to pour strikes in there, and, you know, as you saw 3-2, he's just going to go with that fastball. And he's got enough behind it to still throw it past you. Jerry Lacayo, we can't say a lot about, oh, I can't say a lot about him because I haven't seen a great deal of him but he's had he's been watching plenty of balls come towards him tonight as, <laughs> as the catcher I guess we can say that so he, he's got a good view of the ballpark and knows what's coming he does he's picked up a pretty good nickname from the guys on the squad too is, um, I don't even know if anyone knows his name's Jerry everyone just calls him cowboy but he seems to know <laughs> he seems to know almost uh, anybody in this league I think he's played over here for at least last year a little bit he played in the club circuit he was playing it again here and he spent some time here but every place when we were in um, Gambier last weekend and here he's chatting he knows people so I don't know if he's a, a little bit of a, a legend around here or if he's just a very personable guy but um, he's been a big pickup for us and a big big addition as catchers we had a couple guys go down is there a story behind Cowboy that you can share with a family show or do we just leave it sort of hanging there uh, as far as I know I think it's just based off of his looks he kind of a rugged look I think he either played or came from Colorado in the western United States so in no shortage of cowboys in, in those parts and so I'm not sure who can we who we can actually credit with giving him the nickname but uh, whoever has it's stuck and that's what everybody refers to him around the hotel and the bus and clubhouse and everything here hard hit grounder to Massey we, we could we could run an interesting co uh, contest here tonight just see Massey just covers that so well. It takes a little bit of a hop, actually. It yeah, um, noticing it a little bit earlier when our guys hitting batting practice, and you know, just with the hot, dry conditions, you know, it's so hard keeping the, the dirt soft, and um, you know it's going to rock it off of off of there. Particularly if it hits in front of home plate, it'll bounce, and if it takes something like that in the in the dirt, uh, particularly that as well. Very similar to the conditions we get in Arizona for spring training: dry, hot, you know, hard, dusty fields. Is that Clark? 
with 17 hits, average 233 coming in to this game. And the Tuatara are looking to get their first runner on base here in the top of the third with two out. Another one with long hair. We, we could run the competition here, <laughs> couldn't we? So uh, who's, who's got the best hair in the league? We've got a couple of entries here for, for the Tuatara with, with Zach Clark and, and Cowboy Lakeo. Yeah, that's going to stick. Uh, and then for, for the Cavalry, well, there's, there's Logan King yeah. amongst others uh, down there with, with the flowing locks and there's some more traditional... Uh, nominees say Jack Murphy for the Sydney Blue Sox. There's, there's, there's a few guys with, with, with decent flowing hair around. Yeah, and that seems to be the way it's gone in baseball the last four or five years. The, you know, guys people who doing it up and letting it go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, as you know, a lot of other organizations are a little more laid back. You don't have to be as clean cut. Once again, Kent with that high fastball. That thing has to look like the juiciest pitch you can get with your up there, but unable to catch up with it so far. We'll talk more about Steve Kent and what he's doing so far, but he's got four strikeouts and has conceded no runs through three. The Canberra Cavalry, they've laid on 13 through two. They'll be looking to continue the all-you-can-eat buffet here at MIT Ballpark shortly. Have you tried the great yeah, I've tried it all. Okay. So who are you backing in this game? With their three-point shooting. You guys, relax. I got this. Don't want to miss a second of the action this season? With Tabs Basketball Live Vision, you can stream games and access exclusive previews for free anytime, anywhere. Oh! 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 Don't splash the box. Yeah, don't splash the box. Who are you backing this NBA season? Tab, download the app today. mentioned it a little while ago, Josh Colmenter, that this Cavalry side had really taken some time and, and had been grinding out wins. You can see they're just building here. November was not a good month to be a Cavalry supporter. December was better and, uh, well, it seems to be finishing off quite nicely. Nine and six through December and you'd imagine it'll be ten and six in an hour and a half or so. Yeah, you would imagine. So if you give up a lead like this, you, a lot of things are going to have to go wrong, but... Yeah, you see that the average doesn't really change a whole lot, but a lot more power, and then you see they trim off almost a, a full run in the ERA, and you know giving up less and hitting more and hitting for power is certainly a way to, to jumpstart an offense. And I think most hitting coaches like to see that, um, especially in this day and age where the home run is king um, for the fans, for the team, for the players. Um, you know, to to jump from one home run in the first nine games over the last 15 to be able to hit 13. Um, definitely shows that something clicked, and not just for one guy, but for for several. And the guy stepping in tonight with one on the on the game already is certainly a guy that's capable of doing it. Well, this guy has four for the season, or had four for the season coming into tonight. Got number five earlier, Zach Wilson, and again takes the first pitch and took a liking to it. It's gone like a tracer bullet into the saloon area, or just been picked up by someone running a message between the the, the uh, dugout and the bullpen there. But Wilson. I think he's just decided it, it's go hard or go home here. Uh, the, 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 we won't see too much. Uh, we won't die wondering, I think, is the phrase I'm looking for. I think so, too. And, yes, yeah, it's, it's interesting talking to hitters. Sometimes a guy gets a home run in his first at-bat, and, you know, he just cruises the next at-bat. And then you talk to other ones. It's like, oh, if I get a home run in my first at-bat, I'm just going to try to hit more of the rest of the game. And I think that's definitely the case for him tonight. And he's definitely chasing. down the line. Twisting into the corner. Oh, that's oh, tough. that one drops in. That is so tough. Brown had that covered and then was able to... He, he thought that's going to go fair, uh, go foul. And to be fair to him, <laughs> a lot of balls to that corner, they do tail away. And, and he's saying, yeah, by that much. Uh, yeah. But uh, he's done his best Maxwell Smart. Missed it by that much. <laughs> he sure has. Like I said before, I mean, it has to be something like that for him not to get to it. He chases down almost oh, everything. and Inches. And... You know when it's going when it's going good, it's going it's going great, and that's exactly what's happening for the Calvary hitters tonight as he reaches out and well, Wilson, slaps that one. Wilson with a home run and now uh, a double. And Cone, uh, he is north of 50 pitches for this evening, and the Tuatara closing on at 100 as a as a team. And we're in the third here. What's this going to do for the pitching now, for the pitching staff, for the rest of this series? Because 
you've got to be careful. There's, there's three more games to come here, and you, you can't. You don't want to burn guys out, but at the same time, you don't want, <laughs> don't want to blow out one of your one of your, your, your long relievers yeah. in Cone. Yeah, we've had a, um, we've had, you know, a real hodgepodge of pitchers coming and going, and guys trying to piece and patchwork innings and games together, and. Um, Particularly unfortunate tonight because Jimmy's been one of the guys that can give us five, six, or more innings um, each time out. And that really helps, especially the first game of a series, maybe save your bullpen a little bit. But we just lost uh, two guys back to the Japanese league, picked up one more. We do have a pitcher coming in on Saturday to start on Sunday, but it's his first one of the year. So um, a young kid going tomorrow and another Kiwi Elliott Johnston. So um, right now you're just hoping that Cone can get through maybe another inning or two. Um, and then you just try to ride out, pick somebody, and hopefully it works for them and they're able to have a couple quick innings. I can see Harada on the mound in the bullpen. And he's a guy, too, that he could throw today, he could throw tomorrow. It seems like his arm never runs out of never runs out of bullets, so he might be a guy that you see in three of these games, even after throwing a couple tonight. Uh, he has that type of arm and that type of ability. I think Cone's on 60. That's by my unofficial count. Yeah, and right now you just want to and get first pitch outs. The only thing is throwing in first pitch strikes, giving up a hit more often than not. So you're seeing these 2-2 two, two and 3-2 counts where he's, he's really got to work to get an out as he gets the strike out there on that slider. I think that's the first person out struck out looking tonight. I think so, yeah. I think all of Kent's have been swinging. Well, we, we, had the check, we had the check ball. swing. Yep, but check swing. Uh, Zach Clark last inning with another check swing. I think there was another high high fastball that was swung through by Snyder. But there hasn't been a lot of called strikes in general, um, especially for this Calvary side, as they've been rather aggressive. Robbie Perkins out there now. He's uh, one for one with a walk as well tonight. And if my maths is any good, after going four for nine last week, it means that in his last ten at-bats, he's now batting 500. Yeah, you'd be five from ten. So that's um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's if you could be that every five for ten, that's what you would want. So take those stretches when you can get them. It's amazing how quick it can come and go in this game. But um, unfortunately, we're seeing that not just in terms of a couple hitters, but in terms of two teams as the two attire can't seem to get anything going, and the Calvary are sitting here with thirteen runs through through one out here in the third. Is it a small win? for Auckland here if Scott Cohn can sit three down without giving up another run? I think so. At some point you have to, as they say, stop the bleeding and you know, just to keep it there. I mean, it's a huge number. Um, uh oh But you do want to keep it there and, and not let it get too out of hand. Um, right there as they move up. Um, but now, I mean, now you're looking at two outs, a guy on third. You got a chance to, to have a somewhat clean inning here. Perkins with the fly ball to right yeah. field, and Brown gets a better beat on this one. Mind you, he doesn't have to foul pole on the line to strike. Exactly, him. yeah, they finally hit one in his range that he could go back and make a play on. But uh, the ball's been, I don't know if it's traveling well or those have all been well struck, but there's been a lot of balls to deep right field tonight. Uh, I mean, starting with the leadoff I, hitter I hitting a double out there and the, the big home run, but there's I, been a few balls that have gone out that way. I, I've seen a lot of um, a lot of baseball at this park as... We see Kyle Perkins swing through uh, and miss um, on hot days like we've had today. Hot, dry days like today. The air is thinner. The ball yeah. travels further. So so you're going to get less value for your hits now as it cools down and the air gets more dense and Perkins goes ground ball. Taniello at shortstop sends it across to Guiyan Yu, Zhu rather. And uh, the out is done. And Well, we talked about <laughs> stopping the bleeding and, uh, well, they've stopped it. We'll see whether that's temporary or, or what happens in this game. But... We are going to a break with, uh, it's still 13 nothing after three.
MIT Ballpark in Canberra on a Thursday night as we start off the seventh week of the Australian Baseball League. And that man has had a flawless night so far. He's been through three innings. He's only faced nine batters. He's struck out four. Steve Kent just does it time after time after time uh, for the Canberra Cavalry. Now, he's a starter. He's capable of going a long way into the game. But with 13 runs, Josh Coleman, with 13 runs under the belt, what do you do here? Do you say to Steve, well, we're going to give you a short night, we're going to save some something? Or do you say to him, here's a chance for you to really just go out there, do what you want to do? Yeah, I think you just let him go, especially in this league where you pitch once a week. You're not trying to get him back in five days or something like some other leagues, especially over um, stateside. So... Let him go out and do his thing. He's obviously not run into any trouble yet. I don't think he's pitched out of the stretch. So, yeah, you just let him run away with it. and He's pitching really no stress out there. And, you know, that's probably got to be working in his favor as he's be able to rear back and throw that big fastball. Eric Jensen, Taylor Snyder. Uh, sorry, Eric Jenkins, Taylor Snyder. And Nick Taniello due up. And Jenkins has the 1-1 count. And this will be a good, yeah. This will be a good stretch for the two Tuatar. Getting back to the top of the order, you've seen him once tonight. Hopefully, be able to put together some good at bats and at least, you know, make something happen. Get a couple guys on and and get in the mix here as they've been unable to through the first three innings. So take us through the the, the Steve Kent action. Let's see if we can uh, get some shots from behind the show, show you the grip and see what we can what we, what we can learn about. Uh, this this man who's played a lot of baseball for the Cavalry got as high as AAA on, from memory, a couple of stints in the USA. Yeah, he's got a really good fastball and um, he really coils it back and comes kind of up and over and really pulls it down. And, you know, throwing from that angle, he can kind of take advantage of down in the zone and up in the zone. You see that's what he likes to do. If he can throw it down in the zone and up, it's almost like two different fastballs. Jenkins goes with that one down at the knees. So Kyle Perkins coming around, he's chasing, and uh, I wonder whether someone will take a video of that one and, and, and take it to Max Brown and, and, and say, you know, you've got to cover it all the way to the line, <laughs> yeah. you can't just go missed it by that much. Exactly, yeah, he's he's had a lot of work out there tonight, but yeah, and um, liken him almost to what I do, I throw way over the top, kind of like that, and if I can throw fastballs down at the knees, I can take advantage of throwing that one up. And it looks a lot different than throwing one, you know, belt high and then trying to go up from there as there's not a whole lot of difference. But pitching at the knees and then pitching at the chest, um, it's like two different fastballs. And obviously he loves throwing his fastball and goes right after guys, as we see there, with a the fastball away. And finally the two Tuatara get a break there as the umpire is going to let that one go. And so you can say the, 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 the break there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, being, being the guy who lives here, I, I, I have to be a little bit careful. Yeah, I, b I believe it, yeah. But now we have a guy on base, and this is the guy that you want on there. I mean, against the lefty, we'll see if he tries to steal it all, but you'd think in this situation, um, probably play it safe as you don't want to run into any outs. Um, but if they could get a couple guys on and maybe scratch a run or two across, you, you breathe a little bit of life or at least a little bit of momentum, get it a little bit back on your side and, and not feel like you're in, in, such, a, in such a hole. Snyder obviously hasn't got the memo about taking anything from uh, Steve Kent swings at the first pitch. It was there to be swung at. Yeah, I mean that's what he's going to do. Is I mean he can, he's at the luxury where he can just throw pitches, and he loves throwing with his fastball. So he's going to come at you. And, uh, so far, the breaking pitches he's been throwing, you can't quite find it. But odds are you're going to get a fastball. Kent going inside, and he really makes it tough on anyone to steal, let alone someone with the speed that. Jenkins has out there is he's almost exclusively kind of a slide step quick step which is atypical for a lefty is you know you're looking at the hitter or looking at the runner you, and you can see if he's going to go or not a lot of times they can still incorporate that big leg kick but so, so, so let's have a look uh, let's actually go through uh, take it through step by step as, as 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 Steve goes we'll stay with Steve if we can yeah so as he comes set you know lefties have the advantage where you're looking at the runner the whole time and a lot of times guys will employ a high leg kick, bring that front leg up high and um, do almost what's called a read move where they can come up nice and slow and see if that guy's stealing. If he does, you try to pick him off and get him to throw him out at second. But instead, he just employs coming set and it's just a quick step, just barely lifts that 
foot up and he goes right right to home plate. Uh, very similar to what John Lester does. Is I was going to ask, does he remind you yeah, of anyone? Yeah. John Lester, for him, he has the issue where he can't really throw the ball to first base and pick off. He's not going to do it. So for him to shut down the running game, he just tries to be as quick as he can to the plate and doesn't really incorporate any type of a leg lift. And that's much what Kent's doing here. Jenkins almost, as he as you see the strikeout from Snyder here, Jenkins almost as though he's trying to get really get Steve Kent's attention. Just to see in the background here with the, the arms swinging and the, and the gloves hanging. Yeah, and you can see there, you know, when he first comes up, Jenkins' first in, um, inclination is to go back towards the back. So odds are that shows you he's not trying to steal, but he, he could be bluffing where you think he's you know, holding tight to first base and the next thing you know he takes off. But a situation like this, I just think you want as many base runners as you can and you don't really want to run into an out, especially... A guy that's a little bit tough to run on with that quick step. So now we have Nick Taniello had the 6-3 to three ground out. I think it's just his third game that he's appeared in. Yeah, he he was around Maybe for... He, yeah, he got in, I think, last Friday. So he appeared in one of the doubleheader games on Saturday and then on Sunday. So hopefully he's you know, gets his timing down a little bit. And you can tell that he knows what he's doing up there. Um, another one of those guys that has... Uh, I talked about his first step bat, just a quick swing where those hands don't have a whole lot of movement and he just goes right to the baseball. And that's what you want against a fastball pitcher, especially someone who can you know, bring it in the low to mid-90s. What was Mount Gambier like last week? It was a, a first for the Australian Baseball League to play there. Uh, and, and for you guys as the home team, uh, did, did the town really open up and, and, and accept baseball and accept you guys as, as temporary Residents, they so sure did. Yeah, they offered it, and they must have done a, a brilliant marketing job. Um, offered it as a free community event, and I think they said that they had you know close to 2,000 people there over Saturday and Sunday, um, and so they had people up and down the lines, people in the outfield. Uh, we got to experience a temporary power outage, so they had fun <laughs> with that, with playing playing music and putting the cell phone lights on and everything like that. But, yeah, they did a good job. It was one of the more interesting fields I've ever had the uh, had the fortune of playing on. We can get to that after this pitch. Is Once again, that high fastball, guys just can't catch up to it and can't lay off of it as Tantalou goes down on strikes. On the plus side there, Jenkins has managed to finally steal the base there as Tantalou swings through, and there's Jenkins now. Standing around <laughs> at second and enjoying himself. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, in that situation, you know, he might have been able to, you know, kind of sneak one pass. But I think the Calvary aren't too concerned with him getting down to second base with two outs now, and particularly with what the score is. But yeah, the field was interesting. It was almost all grass everywhere except, except for, for some the cutouts. small cutouts. And uh, typically, you see cutouts and they're a certain shape. But uh, particularly the one at second extended almost halfway into where the second baseman and shortstop would play. So sometimes they were playing where they'd be fielding a ball that was coming all in the grass and might have only got into the dirt at the last second. So uh, it was an interesting setup and made for some interesting bounces as Lamb Hunt drives the ball deep to left field there. And Tuatar finally get on board. And because the ball bounces into the fence <laughs> and Carl Perkins retrieves it there, we see Eric Jenkins... Courtesy of a walk, a stolen base, and now just seeing, yeah, has he turned that into a double? Yeah. He has turned that into a double yeah, there, so. Giving his batting gloves and everything to the first base coach. Lamb Hunt dispatches this. This is a hard part of this park to field in over there because it just, it suddenly gets deep on you there. It's where the, the fence sort of just continues <laughs> out. It's a slightly funny shape, and it's just a little bit deep there. And it's, so it's a difficult part of the park to field in. And Auckland pull one back, one down, 12 to go. Yeah. And, and we've got a tied ball game. Yeah, and right there you see maybe he goes with a fastball typically, but you, know, you can tell he's trying to get that curveball, and he dropped that one in there, and Lamb Hunt was all over it. And there he is right back to the fastball. So um, even with a lead like that, a pitcher never likes to give up runs, and I'm sure he's none too happy about it. And you wouldn't want to be Max Brown coming in off the back of that, would you? I don't think so. I mean, you could see with that first pitch. I think he's... Oh, is that ball oh, just, just, squeaks so down, just squeaks down the line. Maybe Max has had enough of those balls. As he's rounding second and going to third, and 
in there with a stand-up triple. Maybe Max was tired of seeing those fielding out there, and he decided to give them a little taste of their own medicine as that one just squeaks down the right field line past the diving first baseman. It's brought Daniel Lamb Hunt home as well, so that's two runs scored. You'll see a big puff of dust as that hits the ground, and then you'll see another puff of dust uh, which has been raised by Craig Massey. So it started fair and then gone into foul territory, but once they, once they start fair, they stay fair past the first baseline. Don't matter, don't matter where they go. Yeah, and that's, that's the one unfortunate thing about pitching is those balls typically when they go that way are curving away from the uh, from the diamond and so sometimes you could give up a bloop that barely hits but it spins right into the fence and you know 120 foot hit becomes a double all of a sudden As Richard swings and misses at the first pitch here which is at the pop fly to first in his first at bat and you can tell Kent's still out there trying to work on this curveball and this is a chance that he has to you know to try to get a feel for it maybe not even for this start but going into another one as you know he's going to have the fastball but having something to go with it and play off of that particularly that big over over the top curveball plays perfectly into for him because he likes throwing that fastball up and then the curveball comes out up there too and so guys have to determine if that pitch is going to come down into the strike zone or stay up there and it just increases the effectiveness of both pitches. And you've got just that fraction of a second to make up your mind. You've got to make up your mind basically when the ball's you know, a foot out of the hand if, you, if you're disguising the, the, the curveball uh, so it looks like the fastball. And, and to do it, you can do it on the, on, on the mound in practice all you like, but there's nothing <laughs> like doing it in the game. That's exactly right. There's nothing that simulates anything. I mean, even if you have a guy stand in in your practice, uh, it's still not going to be the same mentality adrenaline aggressiveness is once you get in a game situation and Richard swings and misses at it. another fastball that out over the plate but up just enough well, and then he takes the one that he probably wants to swing at right there the conductor comes up and says tickets please punches <laughs> that one and Chris Richards uh, the third of three strikeouts and that gives Steve Kent one two three four five six seven for the night through four yeah I think he's having a night we'll see if it continues soon but Auckland pull a couple back. It is 13 runs to two, middle of the fourth on ABL Week 7. I love it when, 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 you, when you're in sync with somebody, <laughs> Josh. And, uh, I, I think we can tell the story from, from what's just happened in the break there. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think so. Um, definitely working the telepathic waves over here. As you wanted to mention something about a, uh, Twitter, and before you could even get the words out, Nina knew exactly what you wanted to feature and what you wanted to talk about without even looking at your phone. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's, it's a new Twitter account. They're going to love this. I, I have no idea who runs this thing. It, it's someone who has incredible math skills, as we've got uh, a borrow call to the bullpen happening as well. We'll give you some more details on that in a moment. It's, it's a new account. It's only got about half a dozen tweet, tweets. It's called the ABL Mendoza line, or at ABL Mendoza line. And th they're picking players and saying what they need to do to either get to the Mendoza line, a batting average of 200, yeah. or, or stay above. And we'll, we'll, we'll highlight a couple of those before the end of the night as well. But let's have a chat about Yuki Harada as he comes in to replace Scott Cohn. Yeah, Yuki kind of throws from a goofy, not quite sidearm, um, lower angle, almost like he slings the ball. But he can sling it up there at you know, 92, 93 miles an hour. Um, it features a slider off of that. But in addition to kind of what Kent does, he's able to sling that pitch kind of up in the zone. There's the first pitch out to right. Max Brown takes care of that one. and I mean, this is what they need is quick outs. It, I mean, it doesn't matter what happens, but they just need quick action. And they hopefully they can get a couple that. innings from Yuki, yeah. Um, and I think that's the first inning that they've been able to retire the first. No, they, first got, they got Craig Massey in the oh, second okay, in the as well okay. on, on the strikeout, yeah. Um, but that's what you need. I mean, getting that first out is 
so crucial in any game, but especially here where you, know, you just want to be pitching and forcing the action as opposed to what we've seen the first three innings where they're just pitching with runners on behind in the count all the time, and it hasn't gone well for the two Atara pitchers so far. Scott Cohn, by the way, 2.2 innings pitch, six hits for six runs. Only three of them were earned. Uh, 67 pitches all up, 35 strikes, two Ks in their five ground outs. And a fly out uh, as he has been now replaced by uh, Yuki Harada. And Harada draws a swing from Kuki Ayagi. Ayagi makes it fairly easy for Jenkins. And Jenkins, nice technique there. Maybe a little bit casual to, to, to finish it off, but he had it covered. Oh, yeah. And that's one thing about a guy with speed like that. He makes almost any ball that's hit out there look pretty casual. As he's tracked down some pretty impressive ones uh, throughout the year. But uh, it's tough to hit a ball over his head without it getting out of the park or he's going to be able to catch it. But you saw Yuki, the first pitch there, kind of has that sweeping slider from that low angle, just kind of sweeps across the zone as opposed to someone who throws from a little higher angle that gets some depth on that. But, um, you know, two outs and three pitches, this is exactly what the two Atara need. We had David Candle do a pro tip for us a couple of weeks ago about outfielding as we're back at the top of the order for the Cavalry for the fourth time through. And it is Michael Francoso who is uh, two for two plus a walk. Both of his hits tonight doubles. Uh, and Candle has talked about, you know, work out where the ball's going to land, see where it's going to peak, uh, and, and then just be there at the spot. And short, diff slightly different look about it from Jenkins there, but he did all the fundamentals. And if you do the fundamentals, you can make it look casual. You can make it look easy because you've done the hard work to get in the, in the position. Yeah, and he's one of those guys that has the combination of not only being fast but also being quick. So when he moves, opens his hips to go after the ball, uh, he's... That first step is so fast. He gets there. Harada gets the strike out there on the slider in the dirt and, you know, score a couple runs, get three quick outs, and you know, the two are not quite back in business, but at least on the right track. I reckon that's the quickest inning we've seen so <laughs> far, or quickest half inning we've seen so far. As we go to the fifth, it is still Canberra 13, leading Auckland 2. See this? This is what you mean to us. No, seriously. Why? Because we see greatness in you. It's right there, inside, just waiting to be discovered. And we should know, because we're number one too. Number one in the ACT, for full-time employment, for starting salary, for student support, and learning resources. Yep, all the things that matter. So even though we're number one, you're still number one to us. Might sound corny, but hey, it's 100% true. Steve Kent back on the mound for the Cavalry as they commence the fifth with an 11 run buffer and while the offense has been going berserk so is this man on the mound he's dismissed 12 seven of them with big K's Josh Colmenter you're a pitcher tell us what you like about this yeah I'm mean, I think we knew coming in and talking about the game plan they knew he was going to come at him with fastballs but he throws that fastball that's just above the belt that looks so appetizing to the hitters and they just can't catch up with it as you see you know, three of these first four, a couple even on check swings. That one he gets on the curveball. That's probably the best curveball he's thrown of the night, but right back up to that high fastball, up and away, and there's just nothing the Tuatar have been able to do to catch up with it as you don't see that last pitch, but he's going to come at you with that big fastball, and it's up to the hitter to be ready for it as he pours one in right there against um, Ichi, as we like to call him. It's a lot easier to say his name that way than... I'll go with that. Yeah. So I'm going to even write that down. Yeah. Ichi. If that's what they all call him, uh, I, I, I'm happy to go with that. Yeah. It seems like all these, I mean, they'll tell you their name, but then they'll tell you what they're called. And I don't know if that's from playing baseball with um, all around the world and it just makes it easier. But almost each one of them has a, a nickname, whether it's related to their name in any, in any fashion or not. The research that we could do to find these... <laughs> find these stories out. The, the problem with nicknames is yeah, you're going along quite nicely and then suddenly you, you find out some of them necessarily don't have that family friendly origin. <laughs> exactly, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. Often you don't find out until halfway through the story <laughs> yeah. and that's a broadcaster's nightmare. Ichi swings through and there's yeah. that high fastball again. He got him 
you know, twice to chase fastballs kind of up out of the zone. And that's Kent's bread and butter as you see this pitch here. You can't get a job at bunning selling ladders, this man. He just gets people to climb and climb and yeah, climb. Yeah, it is. And, you know, with that fastball coming out from almost behind his head with that higher angle, you don't get to see it nearly as much. And more effective for him pitching up in the zone than down in the zone, really, is does one again there against Lacayo. Cowboy Lacayo. In the, uh, the the GBL in Queensland for Surface Paradise. Uh, and um, he's a bullpen catcher at AAA as well. So for the Colorado Springs Sky Sox. And I can tell you, bullpen catchers, well, they're popular here. Michael Collins, former cavalry manager, Bullpen catcher for the Houston Astros in, in the show, doing it big time. Yeah, I think as a as a catcher, it's a very advantageous job. Especially most clubs seem to be going to two now, where they can have you know a righty and a lefty or whatever you want, getting loose at the same time, and you know, not a bad way to make make a living traveling around and essentially living that entire life with you know out of having the stress of being in the batter's box or out there in prime time. As he puts together a good at bat here, it goes to two to two. So, Lacayo had the ground out at first, previously hit it up the line, and Massey picked it up and brought it in. And we're um, being reminded that the Colorado Springs Sky Sox are, are no more. They've uh, rebranded. I was talking a couple of weeks ago with Eric for the Brisbane Band. It's about it. Uh, and we won't read too much into what may or may not have recently been voted upon <laughs> in Colorado, but... What are, they, what are they calling now? The, the Rocky Mountain Vibes. And no. I think we'll just sort of leave it at that and just let that one trail off like a, a, an errant puff of smoke as uh, Jerry Lacayo strikes out. And that's nine. That's nine for the night. Uh, I, I suspect we're not going to see Steve Kent departing this game anytime soon while he keeps just ringing up strikeout after strikeout. No, he's pouring it in there. You know, ahead in the count most of the time as he's able to get ahead with that fastball. Hasn't really found it with the curveball too much but really hasn't needed it he's mixed in a couple here and there but uh, he's just fastball after fastball after fastball and of course as we say that he drops in a curveball there for a strike and if he can do oh, that welcome to the wonderful world of commentary <laughs> yeah <laughs> and if he can do that now that fastball just becomes even more explosive as he's going to try to get him to chase it up out of the zone Again, he's got a head in the count. He's, let's see, the the one, two, three, four, five, six. The last six that he sat down. So he gave up a walk and a couple of hits in there. But the last six that he sat down have all been strikeouts. Close curveball there. He's probably trying to work on that a little bit more and just get a feel for it. One, two count. But as we've seen with the last two guys, at some point they're going to get a fastball kind of up in the zone here. Oh, instead, that one's well, maybe not. down and in. and you know, Wherever he's throwing that fastball, it's been tough to catch up to tonight as he sets down the side on strikes there again. Uh, Steve Kent has struck out four in a row. He has struck out a heap tonight. He's into double digits now. He's got ten strikeouts. And the Canberra Cavalry, they maintain the 11-run lead going into the bottom of the fifth. It's 13-2 at MIT Ballpark in Canberra. With that thing. You tried the great yeah, I've tried it all. I so who are you backing in this game? With their three-point shooting. Okay. Guys, relax. I got this. Don't want to miss a second of the action this season? With Tabs Basketball Live Vision, you can stream games and access exclusive previews for free anytime, anywhere. Oh! 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 Don't splash the box. Yeah, don't splash the box. Who are you backing this NBA season? Tab. Download the app today. Hole going on. I suspect that's been put together by an Australian Football League fan, going by the brown and gold strikes there. I, I don't know. You know much about uh, about Australian rules football, Josh? Uh, not nearly as much as I've learned uh, about rugby, rugby whether yeah. union or league. But uh, caught a couple games. I was rooming with uh, Daniel Lamb Hunt, and he likes watching 
all of that stuff. So we were getting a little bit of a breakdown and obviously seeing the fields with the four posts and uh, watched a little bit of it. But I'm sure if I sat down and had someone explaining it to me, I'd be able to pick it up. But there's a lot going on and a lot of guys out there, and it's fun to watch. We actually were playing Trivial Pursuit Wasting Time the other day in the hotel lobby, and one of the questions was what came up as a way to keep cricketers in shape? And it was the answer was Aussie Rules Football. Indeed. And uh, so we got a little bit of information that you know, even the guys that follow it and know it and are from here had no idea. I'd love to sit down and explain it to you sometime, but you'd, you'd, be, you'd be kind of busy during the, the AFL season. <laughs> so at some stage down the track, you ever get down here during our winter, we're more than, we'll make you more than welcome. I'll get you along to a game, all right? That sounds great. But, but a big thumbs up to you, by the way, for being one of the, the, the few Americans who I've heard say that, that it acknowledges the difference between rugby league and rugby union too. Uh, don't get a lot of that. It's normally all bracketed in as rugby as Cam <laughs> Warner throws one high in the air and Brown comes in, takes the catch comfortably in in shallow-ish right field. Let's go with that. It wasn't quite shallow, but shallow-ish. Yeah, and Yuki's doing exactly what the Tuatara need right now, throwing a lot of strikes, getting outs, getting outs early in in the count, and uh, they need he's, someone... He's thrown eight pitches for eight strikes. <laughs> and they need someone to, you know, to be able to bridge a couple innings here and, and save what we have down there in the bullpen for, you know, a few games going forward. Massey takes one low and inside. What's the biggest comeback, actually, you've, you've ever played in? Have, have you ever had... A, oh, no, I'll, I'll, I'll let you go either way. Either the biggest lead you've seen <laughs> a, a, a side lose or a game that you've suddenly won from out of nowhere. Is there one that really sticks in your mind? Um, I'm trying to think runs-wise. I remember we were um, tied and we gave up four runs in the top of the 10th and came back and won on a walk-off grand slam to score five in the bottom. Oh, nice. And so you don't see that happen very often, but... Um, I remember some long games, but I don't particularly remember. Chopper from Massey gets across, shortstop to first. Some huge comebacks, but um, everybody's been a part of some of them at some point in their baseball career. And Harada there, the weak ground ball, and he's just what the doctor ordered for the two Atari to come in here and throw a couple quick innings so far. Five outs and relatively few amount of pitches. Well, just looking here, that is eight in a row for the Cavalry that have sat down. Going back to David Candelis is at bat in the third. Uh, and that's the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's eight. So can they complete the nine with, yeah, with Zach Wilson? Let's hope so. He takes that first fastball in. But Yuki looks as good and as comfortable. He's getting the signs going quick. And that's the same thing Kent's been doing. He doesn't waste any time out there. He gets the sign that he wants and goes and... That helps the defense, too, because they're always on their toes. They're not sitting back. And you know they like playing behind a pitcher that really attacks and goes after him as opposed to a guy that takes a lot of his time between and you know, maybe walks around the mound or rubs up the ball or does anything like that. So Wilson with a home run and a double so far this evening. Two out triple would make things interesting for him for the rest of the night. Oh. Uh, but instead of that, he has a walk and he now has a hit by pitch as well. He's really filling out the stat book tonight. All the different <laughs> ways you can get on base. There's lots of stats going <laughs> in the book tonight. Yeah. And there's not much you can do about that, really. There's really not a great deal you can do. No, especially against a guy that throws like that with the ball sinking in on you. And sometimes it's just you do everything you can to get out of the way, but that ball just keeps following you in there, especially with a right-handed sinker baller against a right-handed hitter. And when it comes just below the hip... It's a lot harder. When it's at the hip, you can sort of get out of the way because you can flex. But <laughs> yeah. when it's just below the hip, you know, no, this is, and you just know this is going to hurt. <laughs> it, it, you know, it, might not hurt it, it might not hurt now, but this is going to sting for a while. Yeah, you'll get, you'll get a nice little mark on it. I know sometimes guys will look and look at the laces of the ball will be on there or anything. And <laughs> sometimes even um, you know, see the logo of the ball if it's something hit hard enough. The logo? Yeah, that that's typically with uh, guys fouling the ball. I mean, it's tough now because almost everybody wears those shin guards, but sometimes fouling that ball off your shin, you really get the laces or even sometimes, you know, whatever the logo of the ball is kind of reverse on there. You should go and ask Brett for royalties if you ever wind up with one of those marks <laughs> exactly. on, the, on the shin. And now Yuki throwing out of the stretch for the first time is been struggling to find the strike zone, losing a couple pitches there arm side. 
And another one up and in. And what was such a promising start to the inning? All of a sudden, two guys on. And he's in a situation where he needs to make some pitches here. Yeah. This, this has been the story of the night, really, for, for Auckland, hasn't it? Every time things start to get a roll on, it, it then gets awkward. And... Uh, I don't know, do you, do you ring the change now? Do you say, well, we've pulled two back, there's still a chance here, or do you give Yuki the chance to, to, to battle through here? I think you have to let him battle through. He's gone out there and does done his job as he flips that slider in there for a strike. Um, yeah, hopefully you can reward him with another inning, but you know, at the same time, maybe you're thinking about down the road, if we can get two innings out of a couple guys, maybe keep them fresh for Saturday and Sunday's games. Right at him. Robbie Perkins has hit that, and that is uh, just hard. That is hard, and that is a, a good way, a good highlight. <laughs> we'll get that one on the show yeah. real later on. The Cavalry walking off the, off the diamond, having not added in the bottom of the fifth. They've done all the damage in the first two innings. They put up 13, but this has turned into a mini contest within this game as we head into the sixth. It's an 11-run ball game, but often they're chipping away, and maybe they'll continue the comeback. Find out shortly on ABL TV. Brimming with brilliant tech, safety, and entertainment, the all-new Subaru Forester. Every moment is a chance to do. Fans having a good night here at MIT Ballpark. We're in the inner south of Canberra, the capital city of Australia. We started off on a hot night, and the offense started hot, hot, hot for the, the Canberra Cavalry. And now it's the man on the mound who is hot, hot, hot. He has 10 strikeouts. His high is 13, so he's looking at that. And really, you'd give him a chance if he gets to if he gets to roll. If he gets to roll through another couple of innings, you'd, you'd give him a chance to, to, to knock that one over, wouldn't you, Josh? Yeah, I think so. He's definitely earned it the way he's thrown tonight. and You know, really hasn't had to throw. Even when they got the two runs in the fourth inning, yeah, he wasn't really pitching high-stress innings. Uh, they were just able to put the bat on the ball and, and get a couple runs. But for the most part, he's just been sticking with his game plan. He's mixing that curveball in a little bit, but it's just a lot of fastballs and – Auckland really hasn't been able to do too much or catch up to too many of them. This is getting into close to being his best performance for the Cavalry ever. It would also be very close to being his best performance here at, at MIT Ballpark. His uh, best performance for the Cavalry ever, uh, November 2015 at Brisbane. Those 13 strikes came. And he has 10 so far tonight through five. As he heads into the top, this is the only part of the order that has really done anything against him and seen him for the third time now. We'll see if he switches anything up. Jenkins has had the pop fly out and a walk and now has another strike. Yeah, and that's the thing is they the fastballs that they want to hit have been taken and the ones that they want to take they swing at. But that's just kind of how it's gone tonight. He follows that curveball off and he throws strikes. That's the one thing. He's never behind and he's not giving in to these hitters one bit and you know, as a pitcher that's exactly what you want to do you, you want to be aggressive you want to go at him and you, know, you want to do that all the time but given the lead he was staked after the first two innings it makes it a lot easier the foul and that would be 85 pitches for Kent so far 57 strikes and he just keeps pouring that fastball and he's able to get it in the hands like that but can pitch it away pitch it up can really move it all around In another foul. How much of pitching's memory? Uh, quite a bit. I would say, I mean, you can get any amount of statistics and analysis and everything about this is what a hitter does, but uh, the thing that I like the most is what you've done against a hitter before. And facing him for the first time, you kind of get the advantage that he's never seen you, so he doesn't know what you have. He flips in the curveball there for a strikeout against Jenkins. But once you have a couple at bats against the guy, particularly you can remember the swing and you might not be able to remember sequences and pitches, but for me, 
contact, whether it was an out, whether it was a hit, you kind of remember all of those. Watch this. And so that's nasty. Yeah, I mean that's the, the exactly what we were talking about. That plays off that fastball that comes in on that plane up here that he's getting swings at, and then you see that and you like, all right, I'm going to let that go. It's a fastball up. Next thing you know, it drops off the table into the catcher's glove, and it's strike three. It's five in a row. He struck out. And another fastball and another. <laughs> and that's the thing, right? Like, to be able to go down and away with that, and then maybe at some point in the at bat, we'll see him go up, up and in, maybe in the zone. To be able to put it in all those planes, hitters got to protect a lot more than just, you know, looking out over the plate or maybe down in the zone. He really does a good job moving it in and out and changing eye levels. And it seems like he's really gotten in a groove the last few. This is rhythm, getting the ball, throwing. Even those couple hits he gave up in the fourth haven't affected him one bit. That one from Snyder was fouled off the first base side. This will go a long, long, long way. That's going above the floodlights. It comes back into the glow of the lights now. And that's a really <laughs> good take by Ayagi. He was take, he's taken that like the flash. He's just come in, flying into the frame, and grabs the ball. Yeah, you can see the second baseman in the center field, Durr kind of maybe didn't see it or didn't know where it was and then at the last second he comes swooping in from right field so he definitely had a beat on it and covered a lot of ground to make that catch in basically shallow center field. Well he had that beat on that as you said because he was coming in from the side that went a long way up it went above the floodlights and disappeared now he's coming in from the side and as we know it's easier to watch something from the side than than, than head on. I suspect Candler still had it covered but Ayagi just called him off and ran straight through at, at full velocity. And for a change, it's not a strikeout. For the Cavalry, there's been 17 dismissed, or sorry, for the Tuatara, 17 dismissed, 11 of them strikeouts. And that's just the third fly ball dismissal tonight by my record. Yeah, and it wasn't for a lack of trying. Uh, Snyder was just able to finally catch up to that high fastball. He's one of the few guys that has gotten a piece of it, let alone be able to put it in play. And we're right back to an 0-2 count after two good fastballs from Kent to Tantalou. Tanalu swings through, and well, that's the dozen. Yeah, and when you can do that with the fastball, you really don't yeah. need to throw anything else. So with another two strikeouts there, Steve Kent moves to 12. Auckland do not score in the top of the sixth. It remains 13 runs to two for Canberra Cavalry. Due up, it'll be Robbie Perkins, then Kyle Perkins, and no, actually it'll be Kyle Perkins, and then Logan Kingham rather, and Kuki Ayagi to uh, be in the three spot. Saw Robbie Perkins out to uh, a spectacular driving catch earlier. And uh, it is now Kyle Perkins who is due up. I, I love watching these two when they bat one after the other in the lineup. We haven't seen a lot of it this season, but it's always anything you can do, I can do better. And you can see the numbers there. Robbie doing slightly better in the, in the average in the ABL. Uh, and uh, getting the better of it in the minor league scene. Uh, but, uh, yeah, there, there's not a lot between them. No, not at all. And I'm sure there's probably a little sibling rivalry, but playing for the same team, no. you get a little bit of uh, f on the friendlier side as opposed to, um, you know, maybe growing up when the little brother or the big brother would try to take advantage of one of them. They're both fixtures in, in the Canberra baseball scene, and Kyle uh, had a very, very, very busy off-season because um, he's part of the grounds crew at this ground, which has been uh, renovated considerably during the off-season. Now, we've got a change in pitcher here. Another bowl call to the bullpen. And uh, we have a new man on the mound for the Tuatara, Josh Colmetta. Take it away. Yeah, so we picked him up 
uh, last weekend. He came in. We needed a left-handed pitcher. As Scott wasn't going to be able to make it. But, yeah, he throws a little bit of everything, kind of throws from a funky angle, more of a traditional lefty that kind of slings it as you see him slow down there and throw a little bit of a cutter slider thing. But um, fun fact about him is he also got an at-bat last weekend. So he came, he showed up, and he's got his left-handed – pitcher's glove his left-handed outfielder's glove and four or five bats so he said he's here to do it all <laughs> and uh, i think he even when he played in the minor leagues was able to do both before kind of sudden as he's been over here he still hasn't picked one or the other how'd he go with the bat uh he just got the one at bat he took some batting practice but just got the one at bat i forget what happened but pitched a little bit as well as you know left-handed pitchers are hard to come by and uh, always good to have one or two of them in in your lineup, and you know, he fits the bill. He's, he's just kind of able to throw. He said almost every day, do whatever the team wants him to do. So if you have a guy with that attitude, it makes it a lot easier on the manager. Logan Kingham, he is uh, one for three tonight. Fielder's choice and a fly out and a double. Draws a strike, or swings it. Swings yeah, it took a big swing there. at that 2-0 pitch. Tuatar have been able to quiet the Calvary bats, at least for a couple halves of innings until that single there, but hopefully they can get a ground ball and get out of this as he fouls another one away. Well, Kingham's been one of the, the, the fringe players for the Cavalry in the first half of the season, but... Coming in tonight, playing at second base. So coming in with a 294 average tonight. That's five hits from 16 at bats, probably. Uh, doing some mental arithmetic, but he um, has a real chance to cement his place in, in a lineup now, as as this side looks to step up in offensive potency, and but also showing good eyes there, good patience. Yeah, that's a, they haven't really been off balance or fooled by much of anything. Yuki was able to make quick work of a couple innings, mainly just by throwing strikes. That was a big thing, but you can see the Calvary, even with this lead, still putting together solid at-bats. He spoils another one there. Kingham just really having an extended bit of batting practice. Now, Harada, we've got two innings for and no hits at all. One walk, one strikeout. Fouls, fouls another one away. Really working with this 3-2 count. And that's impressive. Much like Kent going out there and just sticking with his game plan and attacking, attacking, throwing strikes. You know, not letting up at all with this lead. You're seeing that out of a lot of the Calvary hitters when it's easy to put it on autopilot and just cruise through the rest of the game. Finally gets him with the – finally we throw one of our high fastballs <laughs> right there and get a Calvary to member to chase at it. I haven't seen a lot of uh, a lot of Calvary batters climb the ladder. A long at-bat for Logan King. I'm just double-checking this. I've got Harada down for 20 pitches, 13 strikes. Uh, one walk, one strikeout. I'm just – I'll try and double-check that number, but it's a – uh, either way, a, a short quality outing before being replaced by Matt Wilson. And now we've got Cookie Aoyagi uh, gets it again. Gee, that gap between the third baseman, Richards, and the bag tonight has been exploited by several cavalrymen. And look at this, Carl Perkins. He's obviously been doing the sprint training. He's got all the way from first right around and beats the throw into home. And the cavalry finally get off the unlucky 13. They add one in the bottom of the sixth and now lead 14-2. Yeah, it looks like he was just going to cruise into third base and be content. You know, staying there with the double, but took a lot longer to get that ball as it goes all the way deep into the corner. And, yeah, he's got to fish that from the very, very furthest corner in left field of this park. And that gives him just enough time to slide in ahead of the throw from the from the shortstop. It looks like there's been a couple defensive changes, too, as um, the middle infield's changed for the Tuatar in this half inning. Ayagi comfortably ensconced at second. Francesco comes up for his fifth plate appearance of the night. 
with two doubles, a walk and a strikeout. I suspect his average has probably crept back up over 400 tonight. This is a long ball. It's going out towards deep centre, and that's well run down by Jenkins. Oh, he's forgotten about the run-up. Yeah. Man. Oh, he's <laughs> completely forgotten about it. Now, Yagi, oh, that's the easiest 180 feet that he's going to get to do in uh, probably his whole time in Australia this season. I think so. You don't see that often, maybe once a year, maybe not even that, where, you know, Jenkins tracks that ball down and just kind of coasts all the way in and completely doesn't even think about the guy tagging up at second base potentially. But what a great job. This is what he's so good at, is just putting his head down, going back, and being able to get to a space where he knows the ball's going to land and then go up and make a play. Just trying to work out what's happened there, whether it's the, the, the warning track and the fence uh, just all combining to just throw him a little bit off. And Yeah, I think it's a situation where he might have been thinking the runner was you know, halfway, wasn't going to go back and tag up, but some heads-up base running right there and being able to take advantage of you're know, getting an extra 90 feet and in this case an extra 180 all the way to home. As we see Cam Warner down the third base line into foul territory on that side of the ground and Warner stays in with the long strike. Yeah. Both pa base paths are clear. 15 to the score. I guess in the case of uh, Ayagi, who's put two runs on the board himself tonight, it's not a case of how, but how many. He'd be happy to take that. Yeah, those guys that are quick uh, definitely like to run, and he was able to show it off there. Just misses with the slow curve on the outside corner. A new uh, pivot, new shortstop, Yi Swan. Yeah, they switched the whole middle infield as Luke Wilson's out there at second base, I believe. Unless they kept Tanalu in. No, that still might be... No, I think they did switch to Luke Wilson, maybe. Uh, still Tanalu. No, still Tanalu? Yep. All right. So just swapped out the shortstop. I thought maybe we'd put a couple guys in and let the starters take a break now. There's a new catcher out yeah, there, too. The just spotted that as well. So we've got a new catcher. That was uh, Chun Wei Kuo. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. But let's uh, find out a little bit about how you can be a, a, a better ball player. And uh, a man who there's been a lot of raving about is, uh, is Frank Gailey and what he can do with the slider. This is our G-Form pro tip for tonight. Hi, I'm Frank Gailey from the Cam and Calvary. Just a little Hi, I'm Frank Galley from the Cam and Calvary. Just a little pro tip on holding a circle changeup. So ideally, you want to start with a fastball grip and just turn it slightways right here. So when you turn, it's slightly off-centered with a circle changeup right here. You want to make sure you get extended so your arm naturally pronates thumb in to get that movement arm side run. But first, you got to locate your fastball. How hard to throw a good slider, Josh Calamanta? That's a, a great question for someone other than me. With my high, high arm angle, I've never really been able to throw um, a slider. But it's funny that how people will call breaking pitches different things. Some people only call something that's straight over the top of the 12 to 6 a curveball, where if it goes anywhere sideways, it's a slider. Some guys call what everyone throws a cutter now. It used to be kind of a traditional slider, something that really just slid across. So the uh, etymology of the breaking ball term and curveball slider cutter at different times have probably all meant the same pitch but get classified a different way but yeah the, the biggest thing about any breaking ball curveball slider change up is just to try to replicate the same arm action and arm speed you don't want to give anything away to the hitter by raising your arm lowering your arm to give it away or you know slowing down because they can recognize that if you slow the body down and slow the arm down that something different's coming you want it to look exactly like the same pitch every time it comes out of your hand. I saw uh, one of your early appearances uh, from uh, For Auckland on uh, the Sky TV broadcast uh -huh. earlier this year. 
uh, and they were talking about how they would love to have seen you play cricket with your high <laughs> arm action. H have you ever been tempted? Have you have you had a go since uh, since since coming to New Zealand or Australia at, at picking up a cricket bat or, or, or trying to bowl uh, cricket style? I haven't, but that's what I tell everybody when they're like, "Tell uh, talk about yourself a little bit." As Kent pours a strike in there, the new batter Luke Wilson, I believe, but. That's what I try to tell everyone. I was like, I throw almost like a cricket bowler does, where it's right over the top, and um, you know, probably wouldn't be too hard for me to learn or pick that thing up. But um, have seen enough cricket now with um, watching some of the matches, and was watching a little bit of India Australia today. How'd you go? Did you survive, or did you fall asleep? <laughs> I would. I did it while I was riding the bike, actually. So I had something to go. But I can see why the. Um, <laughs> Was it the 2020 cricket has become so popular? Yep. Just something a little yep. more fast-paced and time-shortened. But the first time I remember learning about cricket and th these day matches or five-day matches, and um, you just think, how long can you can you play? And then you can hit, you know, the whole time if you don't get out and stay out there. And Kent throws a strike in there to make it a full count. But I can see w why you might just go for a couple hours and then have to leave because. Yeah, that can. Yeah, that's the long the match can be rather boring. Yeah. That, that's why the ticket price is so high, so you don't leave. Fly ball. Now that's Luke Hansen has come in and uh, is now departing on a fly ball to right foot. So that's a new designated hitter for the Auckland to Atara. So that's the third change they've made uh, in recent times. That one in the top here in the top of the seventh. Uh, it was uh, uh, in the bottom of the sixth. They replaced the shortstop Snyder out with uh, Sai Yi Swan coming in. And then also the new catcher, Chun Wei Kuo. So that's the third change that's been uh, uh, executed there by the uh, Auckland Tuatara. As we now see Max Brown uh, coming in again. He's one for two tonight. A very rare quantity for the Auckland Tuatara. To see uh, one for two. And Brown... We see the, the uh, little one from outside from, from Steve Kent there looking uh, still very, very comfortable. He'd know too. He'd know his, his PB's 13 in terms of strikeouts, and he'd, he'd, he'd know that there's a chance to beat that. <laughs> Desperately trying to go after it. It's funny how, I don't know if there's just stats people or some people are really in tune with their stats, but seeing it in, across different sports where you know, a guy knows his high point total or whatever it is, and they always know exactly when they've eclipsed it and it's it's funny but I'm sure you know you have a personal best and you always want to try to do it one better and Max lays off the curveball here and gets right back in the count I asked before about pitches and memory and it, and it always amazes me when I talk to guys who uh, who have been out there on the bump and ask them what was going through their mind at a particular stage in the game and you know, almost without exception they can tell you what they were doing pitch by pitch all the way through uh, but we were talking about cricket before. There was a, a cricketer, Glenn McGrath, took 500, 600 test wickets, and he could tell you every single <laughs> one of them, how he got them, which is a phenomenal feat because that's over, you know, 12 or 13 years. Yeah. Worth. You know, could I ask you about uh, someone you? <laughs> could I ask you about someone you pitched to six years ago? And would you remember what you'd done? Only if it was a a big at bat. There's certain ones that'll flash, and you know, in your memory, or like, especially like home runs, you kind of always remember those, just because you don't want to do it again. Max Brown fouls off a 3-2 pitch. but <laughs> That's useful uh, advice for, for, for youngsters up and coming. Yeah, okay. big time. Don't do the same thing as you did last time if the guy w who took you over the exactly, fence. Exactly. Or uh, conversely, sometimes a certain pitch just happens to work against the guy and you just want to put yourself in a situation where you know you can throw it again. So you might not remember the sequence you get there, but you knew the exact pitch you threw him at the end and how you were able to get him out. As Max Brown works himself from 0-2 back to a walk and Good you know, Kent there's Brown. yeah Kent right there I think was definitely trying to go for another strikeout as Calvary have uh, Michael Kenman up in the bullpen and he would be the only guy that I would know in the bullpen just because he was with the Braves organization the same time I was mm -hmm. so got to cross paths with him and he's, and he's had uh, Tommy John and recovering from that yes so that's when I um, came across with him he was rehabbing coming back from from Tommy John. Well, Kent's now passed 100 pitches for the night, so you'd imagine that this is, well, this is, this is the chance to, to equal 
his PB uh, or, or, or surpass it, and I don't think you'll get another chance after that, you would imagine. So he's got, what, 12 so far for the night. One more will level it, and, four, uh, and, and if he can strike out Richards and, and Ichi, then he's a big chance. Then, then he'll, he'll surpass his best and gets the fastball gets, going yeah. again. That's the thing he... You, know, could, you can tell he's definitely getting towards the end of his his outing here and towards the end of it is everything's not quite as sharp but you know everything was on for that fastball right there to Richards you got a one two count with pitch coming you're north of 100 pitches you know that you're a chance as he's now struck out his 13th batter for the, for, for the night so he's equaled his PB you know exactly what he's thinking about with this and he's had some success against Ichi already left on left matchup but those are two fastballs right in a row that got thrown by Richard too might be one of our our best one or two fastball hitters. It's hard to sneak a fastball by him, but you can tell you know, just how deceptive that fastball is from Steve Kemp. This will just be fastball, 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 you would imagine here? Probably. I mean, he's been able to have success just throwing that fastball away to Ichi here. And, uh, you know, he watches one go wide there, but I would think he just keeps pouring that in. I know, it makes it 2 and 0. But this is the spot where, you know, Ichi should look for that fastball right down the middle or middle end. And if he doesn't get that, you know, you let it go and he watches it go wide again. And those pitches aren't, aren't missing by much. The catcher's not reaching too much. It's just very patient approach by Ichi, which he's shown most of the year. He has a pretty good idea when he's in the box. He gets the strike. He pulls that one back, three yeah. and one. So uh, th there's there's no way they're going to pull Steve Kent before the end of this inning. So at this point, do you would it cross your mind to say, well, I can walk this guy and get the next guy, or do you are you still competing? For I think every he's still competing. Out? Yeah, I think you know, there's no time where you know now he gets him back to a. 3-2 count with those two good fastballs away. And he's thrown all five pitches just kind of fastballs away. So I don't know if he tries to change the location here or just go right after him. But you know it's going to be a fastball. And, you know, as a hitter here, it's hard to be tempted to go 100% in on the fastball and have him pull a string on you. But I think in this situation, you almost have to be just sitting 100% fastball. He gets there it was. He's swinging. Yeah. Yep. He's had some success against him throwing that fastball by him up, up and away. So I think he's just going to stick with that same thought process here. And ball oh. four. I don't know where that pitch missed or it must it's a little down or something but it's a tough it looked game like it was sometimes yeah it? it looked like it was right there and unfortunately <laughs> missing by you know maybe an inch or two or is all the difference and well, let's have a look I guess that one did miss a little out further yeah. down in a way than we thought walked Ichi so Ichi's had Two strikeouts and then a walk. Brown gets the free pass to second. Now this was to be Jerry Lakaya, but he's been replaced behind the dish by Chun Wei Kuo. So does a little bit of a, a, a little bit about Kuo. Yeah, so Kuo's uh, played professionally in Taiwan. He's this is his first time with us in a couple of weeks as he had an injury getting slid into I think our last weekend in Auckland. So he's missed the first two and just getting back into it. So I'm not sure where he was able to do his rehab or his hitting, but this might be his first you know, live at bat in a couple of weeks. Well, that Drives that one out to right. Be caught Looked out right there, but yeah, fly out to right field. By Ayagi, and that wraps up the inning. It probably wraps up the night for Steve Kent, but that's a night. That is a performance, and uh, hopefully... A big ovation for him from this crowd here at Canberra as he comes off after seven innings with 13 strikeouts. He equals his personal best, and you can't really argue much about that. 
We may have a look at that again uh, before the end of the night, but as we roll into the stretch here at MIT Ballpark, uh, the Canberra Cavalry have a 15 run to two lead on Thursday night ABL action. Plenty of people up and stretching here at the MIT ballpark in the nation's capital. But as we get through the uh, the stretch, let's check out our brute player performance of the game. And what a starring role this man has played tonight. Steve Kent, strikeout after strikeout after strikeout. Have you enjoyed this, Josh? I have. Yeah, and much the same recipe that he had against us a few weeks ago in Auckland. He comes at you with a lot of fastballs. And, I mean, he had a couple curveballs, that one there to Snyder. But for the most part... Uh, he was all fastball all night, and when you're able to locate and move it around and change eye levels as he did tonight, he got a lot of swings and misses and a lot of pitches out of the zone. And we often talk about players with breaking balls and saying, oh, that, that's a thing of beauty, and then, uh, or, or, or you go the other way and say it's filthy, but tonight this has just been power, largely yeah. power. That's what he does. He comes right at you, and, you know, if you're not ready for it, um, especially pitching up in the zone, you don't have nearly as much reaction time to get there. And that pitch looks so good coming in, but unable to lay off of it. Made it a tough night for the two of our hitters. And he didn't really change anything from the first inning on. You know, the same thing that he did in the first inning before he had any of those runs was the exact same thing he was trying to do in the seventh inning you know, before he departed. And you know, hats off to him. It's a great game. We've got a change for the Cavalry. I don't know whether we'll get down to it or not because... Uh, uh, it's the man at the top of the batting order. Francesco has been replaced by Mills. That was Craig Massey. Big, long foul ball, third base side. So, yeah, Francesco, after starting the game with two doubles uh, and then uh, a walk and then a fly out, uh, he's, he's going to get a break at this point. So, uh, he will be uh, playing. Uh, Mills has replaced him. Mills will play at second and... King and will move across from second base to shortstop. But that is all academic right now as the Cavalry are batting with uh, Craig Massey. Uh, this is going out towards left centre and Massey will get himself on base again for tonight. So he's had a double, a strikeout and a couple of uh, infield outs. And now he's had a second double out to left field. Massey. Yeah, he was all over that first fastball. Hit it a long ways down the left field line and Got the same pitch, almost exact same pitch again, and put a nice swing on it to send it all the way to the wall in the left center gap. And he's, no matter what pitcher's been in there, as the Tuatar make another pitching change, um, whatever pitcher's been in there, the Calvary hitters have been ready and eager to jump all over first pitches. Is that? Is that? Oh, it's another. Uh, it, it's you, Swan. As opposed to Yi Swan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it is all go, go, go here at the moment. And he's got some good stuff. He's thrown three fastballs so far. Features a pretty good fastball. A pretty hard, over the top, um, kind of like power curve, power slider. As we see what Massey's been able to do on his last handful of games. Well, oh, hits in 11 of his last 12 games. Now that's the kind of stuff you need. You can you can build a, 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 a real charge up the standings around, isn't it? Yeah, especially with uh, Perkins kind of doing the same, having a big series, and now some of the guys getting going tonight. If you have a couple guys in the lineup that are really going well, they can make up for you know some people's struggles or something, and definitely put the team on their back and carry them. And that's probably been the case for those two guys. 
This guy's been about the most consistent thing in the cavalry batting lineup for the season. He's put this an awful long way up, and he has parked that in the David Candlest car detailing lot outside the fence in left field. Second home run for Zach Wilson for the night. Second home run for the Cavalry for the night. And, wow, that's a hat full of, of RBIs for Zach Wilson, too. He's having a big night out. Yeah, and again, you know, off-speed pitch kind of out over the plate that didn't, a whole, didn't do a whole lot. And he was able to put a charge in that one. You know, when it's as dark as it is right now and you basically just have light on the field, it looks like it goes a long way out there into the darkness. And... The Calvary keep keep pouring it on the Tuatara here. Sometimes you've got to, and when you when you're a side that's been struggling to get runs, sometimes you need a performance like this. And, and you know we've got to remember this is pro ball. This ain't little league. You've got to keep you've got to keep the foot on. You've got to keep scoring those runs. You've got to treat every bat as though it was equally as important as the last. That's exactly right, and it's a lot, a lot easier to say in any coach and. Either situation, the coach for the Tuatara telling him, you, you know, you're not out of it. Let's get back in it. Let's keep scratching and clawing and no quit. And the same, you know, opposite center, or the same sentiment essentially for the Calvary is like, do this exact same thing. Keep at it. Don't let up. Keep going at them. And, you know, a lot of times in sports there's no safe lead. And, you know, that's easier said, but you want the players to maintain that. And the Calvary sure have is. Well, you keep you, putting you, you spent on. some time in Atlanta. You'll uh, talk about American football and, <laughs> and Super Bowls, and you'll remember no safe lead. Exactly. Candless uh, gets a three-hit game uh, with uh, what will be a fairly easy single to left field. So he's finally getting some form back as well, and that's a great sign for Cavalry fans. And uh, also, there's many people in New South Wales uh, who, who have a lot of love for this man who played for the Sydney Blue Sox for several years as well. So great to see him starting to get some form back going uh, three for four tonight plus a walk. Yeah, I mean, it seems like all the Calvary have been getting going, whether it was last week with a lot of guys having some good good weekends and then obviously carrying it over. But, yeah, that's the last thing you want to be is the team that jump starts the team's offense. And uh, we've certainly done a little bit of that tonight. Now, we've got uh, a pinch hitter coming into the game. So Robbie Perkins, uh, he's getting a break there. And... 19. 19, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm going to need need my memory jogged a wee bit here. Down 0-2 Owen, Owen with a big swing there. But he's opting, much like the catcher we had with Cowboy, the no batting glove approach. We've seen a few players doing that this season. Uh, inside. I think it's Nick. I think it is Nick Hosey. And that means that Nick will get to catch as well. This is a kid who there are rave reviews about, uh, both as, as a hitter and as a catcher. He's got lots of skills behind the plate. So he's one into the dirt to take it to two and two. It takes that kind of hard change up. Down and... Yeah, this is the perfect time for you know, the Calvary to put some guys maybe in a different position if some of them have some alternate positions. Get some of the young guys a chance to get out there and get some action. And, you know, the more at-bats they have or the more innings they play, they're just going to get that much more comfortable for, you know, when it's their time to play or when you need them to step up or whatever it may be. Well, this is something that the Australian League has. The home side gets the advantage yeah. across the course of a series to have four development players, four youngsters added to the roster who yep. can come in. You can bring them in at any time during regular innings. You can't bring them in once you're into extras, but you can bring a player in and give them some exposure. And this is the, this is where, you know, if, if it's blowing out, it's a big win, or it's blowing out, it's a big loss. That's the time you bring them in to, to give them some big game experience. And for a, a youngster like Nick, who's still a teenager, and just another one off this tremendous uh, production line of catches we've got here in, or we've had here in Canberra, and gets gets rung up, gets struck out looking, but he would have learned a lot just from coming out there and, and, and getting just a little bit more time on the bar, uh, 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 in, in the batter's box. And he's going to get to catch most likely to to, um, to Kinman shortly. That's a nice looking pitch there from you from Chen Yu, Yu Swan. Yeah, when he keeps the ball down in the zone, he's got a really good fastball. 
that's what he's been able to do. He's got hurt a couple times with the slider up in the zone, but that fastball's been good. And, yeah, the, the development thing's really nice, especially when the two Tuatara were in Auckland and we were able to use some of the development guys, just, you know, people who probably had no idea that they'd ever be able to play professional baseball in Auckland and just letting them be around the team. And they had so many guys out for practices and stuff, and obviously you just get a few guys to put on that roster. But just wanted guys to them to see what a professional team looked like, how a practice went, and you know, really did wonders for some of the young kids that you know, hopefully will take over this Tuatara mantle and, and run with it in the next handful of years. Am I right in saying, as we have uh, Kyle Perkins with the 2-0, and o, it takes one on the outside, but it's uh, called as a strike by umpire Blake Halligan for 2-1. and one. Am I right in saying that very first win that you got against Brisbane, the walk-off run was actually scored the run the, the the run home was actually one of your development players who's particularly fleet of foot and got home yeah it was they put him in in that situation to run at second base because we knew you know if we wanted um to be able to score on you know whether it was a single or a ball that trickled away or anything like that to give us the best chance and he was actually trying to steal third on a little bit of a pass ball or something and just being that fast put it in action and they threw the ball over the third baseman's head down the line and was able to, to come in. So it was, yeah, quite a moment. I, th I know uh, a lot of the people who were behind the scenes and putting the Tuatar together and been there the whole way and uh, were overjoyed that it was uh, able to take place with one of their local kids. And you know, That's something that he can talk about and other people can see and you know, give them a reason to want to keep coming back and playing baseball and you know really expanding the sport in that country as – it, it's still definitely in its infancy. So, so we've got now this is the one, two, three, four, fifth pitcher. So we haven't really spoken much about Chen Yu Swan yet. And he's been dispatched <laughs> deep by Kyle Perkins. And that's another one over the left field fence. So we may not get too much of a chance to talk about Chen Yu Swan, but I don't know how many more they're going to. Put up as Kyle Perkins. Wow, what a night he's having. That's his fourth run that he scored for himself after a walk. Getting on with an error. Infield out, a single to seven, and now a home run past seven. Yep, and that was another off-speed pitch up in the zone. And if you see this, this thing just stays out over the plate. You, and you can't the, do that to Kyle Perkins. No, and the Calvary haven't really missed any of those. From the first inning on, those sliders that were staying out over the plate for Jimmy Boyce to um, some of the pitches that... Scott left over the plate to the two home runs now from Chin. Fastball's been great down in the zone and keeping the ball down, and then all of a sudden that off-speed pitch doesn't get where you want, and as hitters are licking their chops when they th see that just spinning right over the heart of the plate. And indeed, we won't get to see much more of Chen Yu Swan as he departs the mound. Disappointing for the young man there. Yeah, he's got a... A good arm and good stuff. It's when he gets out on the mound, he just you know hit or yeah. miss, and I mean that's just the way it goes when you're a pitcher. Sometimes it happens that way. Sometimes you're the rooster. Sometimes you're the feather duster. <laughs> and for Chen Yu Swan, it's the the latter this evening. We'll break as someone is warming up to take over from him. We'll come back with some details on that with the Canberra Cavalry with a very comfortable 19 to 2 lead here in the bottom of the seventh. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's develop a new um, a new collective now. That that would be a sadness of beaten pitches, I think. There. Yeah, I think anybody who's ever pitched has been exactly like those two guys, where 
you never expect it to unravel like it does right there, and you're trying to do everything in your control to keep it at bay, and it just isn't your night for both of those guys. Jen and Jimmy, it just yeah. did not go their way. You've got, you've got Jimmy Boy, 0.1 innings, five hits, eight runs all earned. We won't go too much further down that list. And then you've got Chen, uh, Chen Yu Swan, 0.1 innings pitched, four hits, four runs all earned. That's a, that's a hard night at the office. They've just got to bounce back because you, you will see Chen again before the end of the series. Would you see Jimmy out there that's, again? That's something where, you know, he just threw the one inning. You could... Oh, boy, that's gone a mile in the air. That is a monster at in the terms wall. of height oh. just taken in left field by Clark. So Logan Kingham looking to give Taki Tashiro uh, a welcome to Canberra. Yeah. He only flew in late last night, so I don't think he would have been expecting to be pitching tonight. I uh, was looking to give him a big welcome to town. Yeah, he definitely was a rude welcome as well, but fortunately that one stayed in the park as Clark makes the catch on the warning track. And, you know, maybe now this he can breathe a sigh of relief. He's got his first out, and... Yeah, maybe we can do some pitching now. Uh, Tashiro, the sixth pitcher used by Auckland this evening. This evening, and we're only in the bottom of the seventh. Yeah, young kid, only 21. I just got to meet him last night as our um, merry-go-round of players and pitchers continues to go here for the two Otara, so don't know much about him, but getting a chance to see him tonight. Left-handed pitching always helps, and I know we're looking for you know as many as we can, but hopefully he can have some big innings for us in these last four series. So, uh, Yagi is proving patient here. Yeah, he's been around the strike zone, but just just missing the first three pitches, we got a 3-0 count here. Here he pours in a strike. Do you look at Japanese pitchers and, and Asian pitchers who do the, the, the step, that the, the leg comes up and the hold, and it's a long hold and then in? Do you look at them and go, how on earth do you get stable? How on earth do you get balanced in there? Yeah, exactly. I mean, even trying it is, is so much different, but it's... Crazy how oh that's a light call yeah it's crazy how almost all of them have that in there and then have to try to compensate anytime they get runners on and have somebody out of the stretch as you see it there but I imagine there's a lot of drills a lot of practice that go into that but they must teach it across almost all of the Asian baseball communities because you see you see guys from everywhere do that but also the regimen for throwing you know sometimes they'll get done with a start and want to throw more and you hear some of these stories about uh, the incredible amount of throws that they make on a day-to-day -day basis and it's just completely different from anything that we're ever taught in the states in terms of arm care and maintenance and anything like that. Ayagi, well, let's have a look at his mechanics here. This is the pitch that I think has given Ayagi the walk. But as a pitcher, one of the things you're always taught is a you know, balance point and you'll do drills where you kind of come up to your balance point but no one really ever pauses there except you see almost all of these Japanese guys and that's everything they teach you as a pitcher is you want all your weight and your momentum on your back leg to then be able to transfer through to the front and one of the best ways to do that is you know if you pause there and then you see something completely different here where he's got to go quick out of the stretch kind of a Quick step pitch there, I think might have surprised the hitter there as he follows it off. Now, this is Lee Mills batting. So he replaced Francoso a while ago. There's the breaking ball. This pitch is a decent fastball and a slider there. So we'll see if he's got anything more in his repertoire. I mentioned. Uh, in, I was interviewed for a profile piece the Cavalry are doing uh, for an online feature. And Lee's story is he takes a strike there uh, to go behind one and two in the count. I mentioned Lee is one of the great stories about the Cavalry yeah. because he came in, played a handful of games, 11-12 and 12-13, uh, and really didn't set the world on fire. 
Uh, was called up as a replacement player late last year when a couple of players disappeared late in the season for the Cavalry. Came out average you know, 278 across five games and now found, finds himself with a contract for this season. So it, it's a great story. He's you know, been plugging away at local league level and now finds himself back contract with the Cavalry. Great to see. Yeah, and that's what a lot of players... Um, we have a couple guys on our team too that it, you, you just play enough baseball and hopefully you get seen by the right guy and get a break to you know play in whatever league it is, whether... For Lee, it's playing here, or guys trying to play in different leagues all over the world. But, um, you know, if you do well, it's kind of hard in today's day and age for anybody to miss any type of talent. Well, Lee Mills strikes out there after we've talked him up a little bit, but uh, the game is uh, approaching a close. But we're at the eighth, we'll see what there is still to come. But right now, it is the home team doing it comfortably. Canberra leading Auckland 19 to 2. Coleman and Josh Coleman are bringing you all the action in this opening tie for week seven in the ABL and there's something about the man sitting next to me in the commentary box here at MIT Ballpark. Uh, Josh, what was it like? Take us back to that moment, 2007, your name gets called out in, in the baseball draft. How, how, how different is that as an experience from, from the everyday? Oh, incredibly. Uh, even just getting a chance to play in college was like kind of a surprise and then all of a sudden three years later you don't ever think about yourself doing that but to see your name scroll across the computer got a call the round before that Arizona was going to take me and fired up the computer just to see my name go across and then uh, everything kind of changes there and all of a sudden you go from playing in college and going to class and managing all that to it's just baseball full time and um, you know fortunately enough for me I was able to uh, you know have a career that took me into the major leagues and that's Probably even more surprising than me just getting drafted. <laughs> I'm going to ask you about the major leagues in a minute, and I'm going to have to try and dig out something uh, for you to, to scribble on for me before, <laughs> you, before you leave town as well. But we, ha we have a pitching change, so uh, the first borrow call to the bullpen for the Cavalry tonight, and it is indeed Kyle Kinman uh, who's uh, coming out. And let's just make sure it is indeed uh, Zach Clark that he's uh, that he's pitching. Yeah, to. it's Zach. He's got his, his blonde hair sticking out of the helmet down there. Tough to miss. Now, you, you know a bit about uh, about Kyle Kinman. I was lucky enough to have Thanksgiving dinner with him okay. uh, this year. Uh, he is a great storyteller. I can tell you that about him off the field, but tell us what we're looking for on the field from Kyle Kinman. Yeah, I know he's got a good fastball, um, kind of a little bit of an or unorthodox delivery as he like goes forward and hides the ball behind him until the last second, but very quick arm. I didn't get to see him really pitch. This is until we saw him a few weeks ago in – Auckland as he was rehabbing off of Tommy John surgery but watched him play catch and everything and just looking at him you knew he has a pretty good fastball and the big thing for him I think is throwing strikes and that's something that you always struggle with coming off of Tommy John sometimes they say it takes up to two years until you really feel like you have a complete command of everything that you were able to do before that as Zach Clark draws the walk there. It was a good time for anyone really to come on, uh, and you can try different things. You, you can do stuff, uh, and, and while Kyle won't want to be giving up hits and won't want to be giving up walks, uh, there'd be a part of him actually wanting to get a, a good workout because he really hasn't had a good long workout in a while. Yeah, and this could be a chance where you know maybe he gets these next two innings and you know, whatever he's been trying to work on or maybe struggling with, he can try to iron out and. Just get a feel and get a rhythm out there if he knows that he's going to have a couple innings as opposed to, you know, maybe just facing one or two hitters or just pitching an inning. Came and closed out game three of the Geelong Korea series last week uh, through 14 pitches, 10 strikes. So w once he gets his groove going, um, yeah, bang, bang, bang. And last week against Geelong Korea, it was uh, strikeout, swinging, strikeout, swinging, strikeout, looking. So nice way to wrap things up. Yeah, absolutely. And you see there he even dropped down a little bit, so... And maybe that's something he wants to work in or, you know, continue to work through to be a, a little effective. 
quick go, quickly 0 and 2, but now back to 2 and 2 as he's missed with two pitches. I'm going to give you Steve Kent's line in a minute before we come back to talking to you about something else that uh, jumped off the page at me in the uh, in that profile on, on yourself. Ground ball into foul territory, and that's one thing that Jenkins can do is foul off. He had an at bat. Uh, brilliant at bat in a in the series against Adelaide this last weekend where he, he must have fouled off nine or ten pitches. I think it was a 15 pitch at bat maybe and then was able to get a little bloop single in and something like that really just crushes a pitcher's spirit. That's, that may be a broken bat and potentially into a double play. Second, it's Mills to Kingham at short and across to Massey at first. And hard to believe that's the first I'll just double check that. Yeah, that's the first double play we've seen tonight. Yeah, I think Jenkins was. Is he good? I think he was safe though. He he has a tendency to run all the He's way down safe. the line. Well, yeah, I think he go. beat it out. He's. It's tough to turn a double play on, on him. He almost has to hit a perfect line drive to somebody or a one hopper. My apologies to every umpire <laughs> who has ever walked the face <laughs> of the earth that I have questioned a call from. So uh, Jenkins is dead hitting into the into the fielder's choice, and it's uh, Zach Clark who gets out on the four to six play. And then, oh, and that just sneaks through. up the middle. Thought maybe they'd have a chance to to turn one right again as that ball just sneaks up the middle. And you saw Kinman there throw out his bare hand. That's something that I think almost every pitcher does just out of instinct. You want to try to try to get that down, but. Doesn't always work out when you throw the bare hand up uh, there. He threw it out there and tried to pull it back down. Yeah, I, I, rec I reckon it was on the way back down before <laughs> the ball got to him. I think thought. so. I've <laughs> seen I've seen way too many guys, um, you know, deflect it, or all of a sudden it rolls out into the outfield, or the second baseman's going up the middle and it goes right to him. All of a sudden, way more of those than a guy actually make a barehanded snag. And it's, it's almost the the, the wily e. coyote from the old Roadrunner <laughs> cartoon there, where he's standing on the tracks and the train's coming, and he suddenly holds up the side and says, you know, what am I doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, uh, yeah, I didn't really want that <laughs> finger at all. Yeah, yeah, and it's so hard not to do that because it's it's such an instinct. Oh yeah, that you just, um, especially you know, hit like that when it's opposite your glove hand. Now I promise we're going to come back to that graphic, but I think <laughs> in, in respect to uh, what the Tuatara have done here, getting runners on first and second, we'll, we'll stay with the action on field here, as uh, as Nick Taniello has a chance after. Uh, not the best of nights, really, where he's struck out swinging twice uh, and had an, an, an infield out. He's got a chance here with the very speedy Jenkins at second uh, and Sai, who appears to be no slouch uh, as well at first. He's got a chance to, to, to maybe, just maybe, get up a couple of RBIs here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a big gap. They're definitely shading him towards the right side a little bit, but big gaps um, in left center and right center. Let's see if he can put the barrel on the ball. Lays off an off-speed pitch away there. Evens the count of two and two. Well, that's smart play to just let that go. The, the, te the temptation's there, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, he's shown some good discipline, but uh, at the same time, that f that high fastball, he just swung at one from Kenman, that high fastball seems to be his kryptonite early on. A little bloop, which will bounce just short of Carl Perkins in left field, and that loads him up. Trying to think of what we can say, you know, it's 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 not a you know not a, it's not a cavalry player on every cushion or or, or uh, <laughs> you know, something like that. Uh, but I, I have been unable to, to come up with anything that works for works uh, with for, for Auckland, Auckland or, or Tuatara. Tuatara. <laughs> yeah. So we'll just say the bases are loaded. Yeah, you can say trips to it or trip to Atara's out there or something on the pond. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's tough to come up with something that. Feel free to Works as a synonym for uh, for the bases or the base paths or anything like that. Hit your suggestions in <laughs> uh, via my Twitter handle at cjcau. If you've got something there, a nice bit of alliteration that we can use to describe a to a tower player on, on on every base. As Luke Hansen gets his second turn at bat, and this is a chance for the to to you know maybe. Scratch a few more runs across. At least take a little bit of momentum out of this game into tomorrow, as you know most of this game has been uh, the exact opposite of what they thought was going to happen. But you know tomorrow is a new day and a new game, and a whole new set of things could happen. And if you could get any momentum going into that, uh, you'll take it. One and no pitch. 
Count goes to 2-0. and 3-0, oh. and oh, in fact. Yeah. Uh, I didn't give Kent's line, which we really should do. Seven innings pitch, two hits, two runs, both earned. Three walks, 13 strikeouts. Through 118 pitches, 79 of them for strikes, three ground outs and three fly outs. That's a, that's a pretty decent night's work by anyone's standard. And as Luke Hansen gets a strike to go to three and one, I love the creativity that's working up the other end <laughs> of, our, of our box here. It is the Tuataro Totality. <laughs> Copyright Nina Zinnemann, uh, 2018. Yeah, that didn't take very long either. I will pay that <laughs> and I'm going to stick that post-it note on the laptop and that can stay there for the remainder of, uh, of this series. So with the bases loaded, or the Tuatara totality in effect, see, it does sound good, doesn't it? It does. It does sound like something's going to happen. And something and does happen. It's hit oh, hard, and it gets past Mills. Tough hop it? there. Yeah. And that's maybe the worst words you ever want to hear if you're on defense. Everybody's safe. Mm. A ball like that that sharply enough hit that it, if he snags it, it could be a double play. Instead, just kind of comes up off of his glove, and then he, he loses it a little bit, doesn't know where it is, and... Everybody's be able to reach base safely. I'm, j I'm just wondering. There's a, there's a patch on that dirt in, in the on the edge of the infield. Well, he, he here's here's a challenge. The softer dirt, the sort of more scuffed up, and I'm just wondering. I reckon that that has hit that more compact area. As we pan to the left, you'll see it coming in. You see you've got the dirt that's yeah. chopped up, that's chopped up, that's chopped up, and then we'll get towards second, and there's a harder part there as it comes into shot, and I reckon that's where the ball's bounced. I uh, think so, yeah. Up. And it was hit sharply enough by by Luke, but right at somebody, but fortunately he was able to get that high bounce that threw it off the glove. And now out at third. Just the one out. And yeah, and that's kind of the only play you have there. Shortstop running away from second base. You're not going to be able to turn the double play. Not really, just take the easy play at third and get the out. But more excitement for the for the two Atara here as they tick up to four. Yep, and Richards with a chance to maybe redeem himself here. Takes the first pitch away. Yeah, and he's got to be kicking himself because he's such a good fastball hitter. And for Kent to be able to sneak some fastballs by him, I'm sure he was looking his chops to get another at-bat. Let's see what he can do with uh, uh, the pitch from Kingham. That may oh. Oh. <laughs> over under the warning track. Yeah, you, you want to say that's going to be out, but with all the foul territory here, it's almost like playing at the Oakland Coliseum when you have you know an eternity to cover from the line all the way to the – to the fence. So let's check this. Let's check this out. It's coming across. Kenman even making a run at it. Yeah. And then yeah, Cam Warner, you, you can see how far Cam Warner had to go. <laughs> yeah. and, and the fence was looming large uh, there. Yeah. And that, war wa that warning track uh, serving its purpose, warning Cam Warner that it, it, it's probably better to stop at this point, otherwise risk cutting yourself in half on the fence. And now a foul ball over the saloon area, in fact, into the cavalry bullpen. We haven't seen a lot of balls into the bullpen on that side uh, so far this season here at MIT Ballpark. That's a rarity. Yeah, he was way out in front of that that curveball slider, off-speed pitch, whatever it was, and hooked that one. Stays alive there on a really good fastball there by Kidman. You saw the catcher kind of reaching up and in right under the hands. Richard's able to just get enough of it, foul it back. So Richards waits on the one two. And oh. that's gone. Has that got him on the toe? Or the shin? Uh, I think so. Got him on something that I think it ricocheted off the catcher's mask pretty good. Get a replay of it here. Rebound Trying all to over the throw place. that back foot slider. And he does right off of his back heel and then up off the catcher. Pinball and Richards hit by pitcher. Hit by pitch. 
So he'll be he'll be disappointed. He's he's still over for the <laughs> night. You now this brings the lefty Ichi up. A little left on left matchup. Had a couple That's of the first pitch high. About uh, loaded bases for two Tower. <laughs> okay, let's see what we got. Uh, three bags full from Bar Bar Black Sheep. I don't <laughs> think we should really go down that path. That's a, that's a little bit uh, insensitive. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm reliably informed, as we see another foul ball from Ichi, uh, I'm reliably informed that a collective of lizards is a lounge. Um, I, I don't think we can go with a lounge of lizards because <laughs> I, 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 am told, I am told that it is uh, that a tuatara is not a lizard. Uh, a troop of tuatara. But no, I, I still like the tuatara totality. I think we're going to stick with that. But thank you for your suggestions. <laughs> And thank you for sticking with us through Thursday Night Baseball on uh, ABL TV, Sky TV New Zealand, and our various international broadcast partners. Ichi swings and misses at the breaking pitch there, 1-2. Now this would be huge if the Tuatara could get a base hit or something. Scratch off a few more runs, take something positive in. And instead, he takes that big slider, sweeping slider from Kinman. Unusual technique to, to take the yeah, pitch Yeah, I mean, most of the time those guys stay in there, but you can tell the slider just when it's on, gets him to lock up and buckle, and next thing you know, it's strike three. Well, we'll take a break. As we head into the bottom of the, of the eighth inning, it is Canberra 19, Auckland 4, Thursday night, Australian Baseball League. Let's go back to this because I, I, I really want to ask you, uh, and I've still got my school book from calling uh, those MLB yeah. games at the SCG on um, uh, on radio for uh, uh, the national network here in Australia. Um, what was it like pitching at the Sydney Cricket Ground in an opening series? Where you know, uh, only two games played there, uh, you've thrown in one of them. What was that like? It was a lot of fun. It was quite the experience, but it felt like you were pitching in. A Different. It was such a dip, different atmosphere that it was kind of hard to remember that those were actually counted, that those two games counted towards the season. And kind of the makeshift bullpen we had, the makeshift outfield fence, it was just neat to see the cricket ground transformed into a, a baseball field. One of my favorite things about it was in batting practice and just hitting some balls to the outfield, we were able to discover exactly how hard the pitch is on a cricket ground because that was just <laughs> beyond second base. We had a couple balls just bounce right over, almost like you were playing on turf. So we were able to figure that out. But all in all, that was a tremendous experience and, and well done by Sydney and everybody involved for, for that week for us. Cam Warner in, and it's still Toshiro. I, I don't know how many more you've got left in the bullpen for, for <laughs> Auckland. Yeah, we're debuting everybody today. So the rest of the series, the Calvary are going to know exactly what to expect when guys come out of the bullpen. But... Yeah, it's going to be an all-hands-on-deck situation the next three games, I believe. I, I will admit I was starting to live in fear at one stage that we're going to give you the call and I'd be stuck up here on my, <laughs> on my own. I mean, it, it was close to... Chris Richards has maybe the best arm on the team, uh, if not one of them. And he threw an inning in an exhibition game early, and I thought maybe this would be a chance where we'd see him just, you know, just to be used for an inning. As we check to the first base umpire, and he goes there 2-2. Two to two. So that would be sounding the position player alarm? Yeah, but um, he's got a little bit of experience. Not in a while, I don't think. Cause he, when he was originally drafted as a middle infielder, he had such a good arm that they wanted to transform him into a pitcher, and unfortunately he got hurt after that. But he's got one of just the best natural roll-out-of-bed arms I've ever seen. And um, if that one gets fouled back, uh, he actually holds a Guinness uh, world record. I believe it's a Guinness world record. 
Um, him and another guy that he met was working with in, uh, in Auckland uh, did the egg toss. Yeah, and went yeah to the, the world, world record for yeah. catching, yeah. And, and uh, so he's got the arm to throw, um, but it's up to his partner to catch it, which I think out of the two is uh, the much harder feat, but uh, just an impressive thing to put on your resume. Because yeah, that's the thing. It's, it's not just the, the throw. It's not just throwing the egg. You've got to have someone catch the thing at the other end. Yeah, and they did an exhibition at our park in – Auckland and Chris was throwing them from around the home plate area and he was launching them almost to the fence in right field so you know probably 90 some meters and uh, unfortunately we didn't get to see a successful catch but after watching that that's definitely the hardest of the <laughs> two to pull <laughs> off but um, yeah so it, it's one thing it's one thing for them to to provide an exhibition <laughs> of it it's a, it's another thing for them to encourage any teammates to try <laughs> yeah. it. Uh, did, uh, has anyone had a go at, 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 at actually doing it? He threw a couple just as he was walking in to guys that were around, but uh, Chris and another guy, Ricky Poway, um, was actually out there trying to do an exhibition for TV. And unfortunately, I don't think they ever caught one. But Well, that's gone big. That's going a long, long way. And that is another one that has gone out of the park. That's gone more than 93 metres. And so that will see Cam Warner just enjoy the evening air here in the nation's capital with a solo home run. And an it's an another on an off-speed pitch. So many of these off-speed pitches just staying right out over the plate and Calvary are jumping all over them. As you see the little slider here just, just stays out there, doesn't get on the hands, is able to get the barrel out of it. And disappears beyond the... Wonderful trees out there behind the left field fence. So Warner for tonight. Well, he's three for six. He's got a single, a double, <laughs> and a home run. I, I, I don't think he'll get the chance to get the triple to complete the boxed set. Cra Craig Massey uh, is two for five tonight. Both of his hits doubles, one to left, one to right. Uh, and that is now 20 for the Cavalry. It's been a long time since they've rung up 20. Uh, as, as hit before... Before tonight, uh, before tonight, they'd only rung up. I think seven was the most that they'd scored in a game. In a game uh, this season. I know there was a game in Wollongong last season where things went absolutely berserk. Uh, and in fact, there's been a couple of games in Wollongong where Canberra uh, have gone berserk. And I think there may have been been back-to-back -back grand slams or something in that game in Wollongong. I'm trying oh, to remember. Wow. That was a while ago, but uh, unfortunately, it's in my old book. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I would flick back. You can only carry so many big, thick, heavy <laughs> scorebooks around with you. Yeah, on, yeah, only s so much information to be able to catalog through. We'll dig out the Wollongong Classic against Sydney last season and see how that one finished up. Massey, well, he's got a double to left, a double to right, and a fly ball to centre. Jenkins comes on, makes a nice play there. Get the first out of the eighth. Yeah, it's crazy how certain parks are just notorious for scores like that. Uh, all along the minor league circuit, there's certain places, uh, particularly in the California league, where there's some kind of out in the desert where the wind just howls. Yep. And it's not uncommon to see a score, you know, 20 to 15, uh, 25 to 20, something like that, if the wind is blowing just right. Oo pitch catches the inside corner for a strike. Cam Cameron have had some some big scores in the past. There was a couple of games in Perth where where things went absolutely nuts as well. Broken bat, soft line drive to the shortstop for the second out. Was able to get in on the hands there. You're doing nicely on the on, on the play-by-play -play now, Joe. <laughs> and, and, any stuff to the to the CV as we go? Um, yeah, the only thing I have to work on is certain catchphrases. Everybody seems to have a phrase they're known for, for particular plays or anything. But yeah, I enjoy doing it. It's something that once my baseball career is done, I've been told a few times that I would fit in nicely in doing some of that. And um, you know, I've been able to do a couple games and done some things, but. Um. Well, I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll work you back, work yeah. back any time. Uh, obviously, you're kind of busy for the remainder <laughs> of this weekend, but anytime you want to join us here at, uh, at MIT Ballpark, 
we'll, uh, we'll welcome you back. I think yeah. we're going to get a pitching change here. So we will, ahead of a borrow call to the bullpen, uh, take a quick break here at MIT Ballpark where it is Canberra 20, Auckland 4. Brimming with brilliant tech, safety and entertainment. The all-new Subaru Forester. Every moment is a chance to do. So the call to the bullpen, the borrow call to the bullpen, we'll have a pitching change here. Canberra are closing in on a record. There was a game at Wollongong, November 2016, where they beat Sydney 21-11. to 11. Uh, That was a day. Uh, Boss Mo and Aroa, who's not playing this evening, but Boss Mo and Aroa put a couple into a yard on the other side of the street. So the ball went out of the ground, over the road, and into a front yard. Uh, a popular rumour has it that one of them even landed on the roof of said house. <laughs> Uh, it was a day where Sydney uh, managed plenty of home runs as well, or managed one home run, but uh, Aaron Sloan, uh, there was Reeves, Candlers, Robbie Perkins and Boss and Aroa uh, all went yard for, for the Cavalry. 21 to 11. We suspect that's their highest ever total. So okay. they're chasing a little bit of history here <laughs> at, uh, at MIT Ballpark. And uh, this man would love nothing better than to contribute to that history. But he has a new pitcher to do it against. Yeah, this is Brandon Markland. Um, just finished uh, completing college in the States. He's from Vancouver and greatly celebrating a 14 nothing Canadian victory in the World Juniors Hockey Tournament today. Um, has a really, really good arm, uh, mid-90s consistently, and a pretty good slider off of that as well. Um, he's had some innings where, I mean, it's been three up, three down with no chance, and he's had a couple situations like anybody where just can't quite find the strike zone, but when he's on, he's fun to watch. Well, for Toshiro, his line largely uh, binary, 1.1 innings pitched, one hit, one run, one earned run, one walk, one strikeout. And Markland with the 2-1. Fastball driven well into the right center gap, going to get to the wall. And... I don't know how many doubles that is, but it seems like every time they hit the ball, they're not getting on the first base. They're getting second and third or even all the way home. Well, for Candlis, it's the first double tonight, and he's had one, two, three. That's four hits for David Candlis, four for five plus a walk. So for a guy who came into the game averaging 109, eight doubles total for the game. Uh, but David Candlis, his first double for the night and indeed his first double for the season if I remember. yeah that's his yeah, first, first, double. first double for the season so he came in the night with six hits all singles and now he's got uh, 10 hits uh, nine singles one double so things are coming back step by step and yeah. he is he is the, the the record tying 21st run out there at second place and Nick Hosey who well, came in a while ago probably would have thought oh I'm only going to get one at bat gets a second go uh, yeah he sure does What's the young left-hander got here? Markland misses high, and I wonder, do you have a total on um, Toshi's pitches? I wonder if they brought Markland in to get this last out just on a pitch count thing, uh, Tashi, if they wanted to keep him under a certain number of pitches. Uh, Toshiro, 26 pitches, 15 strikes. Okay, so yeah, maybe they wanted to keep him in that 25 range, and you know, hopefully he can be used tomorrow if needed. And Nick Hosey gets a hit as it bounces away from uh, Tanelu and David Candlis <laughs> comes home so Nick Hosey I suspect his first hit in the ABL I suspect his first RBI in the ABL that's a nice little thing to see there and well done that young man and David Candlis comes home for the third time tonight the Cavalry move on to 21 and that from memory ties their all-time scoring record yeah I thought there was a chance he was going to make a nice backhanded play Tanelu there and it just comes up up off the glove and into center field as he was trying to make a great play. and We didn't see Kent get to that 14th strikeout, so hopefully we don't see them get to that 22nd run. Markland deals foul ball down the third baseline, 0-1. That's the crazy thing about baseball is you can walk into a 
park on any given night and really have no idea what's going to happen. It could be a one to nothing game. Uh, it could be a game like this, and who knows? Tomorrow could just be one to nothing or two to one. Uh, it's amazing how it ebbs and flows so quickly. Oh, I've, I've, I'm, I've watched um, 200 and something <laughs> ABL games over eight seasons, if not more. Uh, and I, I reckon virtually every time, <laughs> every game you come to, you see something you've not seen before. Uh, yeah, that's what's great. As many years as they've been playing baseball and how they can do the stats, for stuff to still happen for the first time or in certain situations, it just doesn't make any sense. Marklin finally gets that slider down in a way to to end the Calvary batting for the, for the night, which seems like it's been a long time coming, and we're on to the top of the ninth. Well, th things have shuffled around just a wee bit since we started off this evening. Uh, going coming into this game, it would have been uh, Canberra versus or, or Canberra visiting Melbourne in the postseason for a wild card game. This win for Canberra, uh, let's not assume, but uh, let's say this <laughs> win for Canberra yeah. uh, would change things. That would mean Canberra would be hosting the wild card game uh, in, in that in that postseason. Uh, but let's bear in mind, too, that we've also got in there Brisbane and Sydney are playing against each other at the moment. And I can tell you, Sydney look like they're going to win that one uh, in the top of the ninth. That is 11-2 to Sydney. Geelong Korea actually beat the Aces. <laughs> wow. Is that right? 6-4. Geelong Korea have beaten the Aces. Uh, as we said before, Josh Colmeter, you can go to baseball and you never know what's going to happen. And you've got that side. And let me tell you, little brother will enjoy that win over big brother down there in a very big way. Uh, we've got a one to three play. Haven't seen one of those this evening. Yeah, there just hasn't been a whole lot of plays on the infield in general. A lot of balls in the outfield, and unfortunately a lot of balls deep into the outfield and out of the park. So with one down, and the very, very slow walk back to the dugout. I reckon it may have been a... a that Clark takes high, want to know. It was Quo, and then we've got Clark. This is where you want to try to get something in your last at bat, something positive to go into the next day. Uh, even if you just feel good timing and able to barrel it up, you just want something to go into the next day as Clark swings and misses at a fastball up and in. 1-1 one, one pitch here. Curveball misses up and away. I'll just sit here and watch watch a, watch, watch a, <laughs> a, 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 a picture of Major League Caliber and yeah. I'll sit here and work on his broadcast show reel. I, yeah, I do enjoy it. It's it's kind of fun and you just it stays locked into the game so much more than if you're just sitting in the dugout and you know catch stuff when the ball gets hit or you're talking to somebody and um, it makes it a lot easier up here when you have to pay attention to to each and every pitch and and just quietly you can do it for a lot longer than you played <laughs> for as well. Exactly. Yeah, the physical demands. As long as I have enough water up here, I'll be all right. Works to a 3-2 count here. And this is where Zach just has to look for something, you know, out over the plate. 3-2 count in this lead. Probably going to get a fastball and just don't miss it. And once again, the theme of the night has been that fastball up. And the two Atari have not been able to let it. doesn't matter what pitcher's been in there. That fastball up has been effective. 
we're, we're 24 hours early for Fastball Friday here <laughs> yeah. at MIT Ballpark, but we've got a sneaky suspicion that we might see a little bit of that tomorrow. We'll see certainly plenty of, uh, of sliders from, from Frank Gailey. Uh, who's due to start for Auckland tomorrow? What are we likely to see uh, there? Elliot, um, Elliot Johnson starting. Another young Kiwi pitcher. I think he's only 19 years old. Um, has had some success, but it just doesn't have, I think, the stamina now to to pitch deep into a game. So he always seems to get in trouble, you know, second Ooh, and ouch. third times through the lineup as that one hits Jenkins up and in. He's got that elbow pad on, so we'll see where it hits him. Two out. You're 17 runs uh, down. Oh, that's going to leave a bruise. Yeah. It, yeah, it's it's two out. It's the ninth. You're 17 <laughs> runs down, or something like that. Yeah, you, and that's you the you, last you, thing you expect to happen. You don't want that kind of a souvenir from your fir, pr probably what's your first trip to Canberra. No. Nope. Eric Jensen gets uh, uh, Jenkins gets on base again. So he's actually wound up on base three times out of five plate appearances tonight. A hit by pitch, a, a walk, hitting into a fielder's choice. And he's the guy that we need to get on. And that's why he's been hitting at the top of the order all year because he can. Wreak havoc on the base pass is always trying to steal second, steal third, and he's really the guy that gets us going. We had the steal earlier. Yeah. Follow their 0 2, and. That was a two out steal as well, wasn't it? Yeah, it, yeah, was. it was. It was a two out steal when they were trailing by 13, uh, and now that's it's, it's two out <laughs> trailing by 17, so let's see if they go again. Yeah, I think he's going to stay put for this one. As Oh, single oh, ball up the middle. Oh, oh. nice little backhander yeah. from, uh, from Kingham to Mills to complete uh, a route, I think, is about the only word we can we can really go with it. Yep. Um, our, our player of the game, probably Stephen Kent, with uh, uh, 13 strikeouts. You're hard to go past that. But look at this for a nice little piece of finishing off there on the uh, the fielder's choice. The 6-4 uh, the to four completes... The out gets Jenkins out there, but let's have a, let's have a bit of a look at uh, at some of the offense, and this has been truly a big night for the Cavalry bats that have failed to fire a great deal this season, and this was where it all started off. That's our brute play of the game. That was Zach Wilson, and not to be outdone, he went again later on. I think the first one was probably a little bit bigger. It's hard to tell as it, once it gets dark here, but Wilson... Yeah. He, and he monstered that, and then a few moments later it was Kyle Perkins. Yeah. I think Kyle may have enjoyed himself just a little bit. And then the fun weren't done to drop into the Caribbean lingo for just a moment because Cam Warner hit his first home run for the season last week, and he has doubled his season tally with a monster over left field there. So plenty of, of home runs there for the uh, Canberra Cavalry, plenty of runs in general as they run out and run is the appropriate word there 21 to 4 victors uh tonight that's a tough night at the office for, for your teammates josh colmetter yeah it is and uh, i mean that's the beauty of baseball is there's always tomorrow and we have three more games in the series so losing the first one i mean in this fashion uh, definitely salt in the wound tonight but uh, we have three more games and we can easily turn this thing around and I think that's ex the exact message we'll get in the clubhouse tonight and that's the exact message we need to take into the rest of this weekend. But let's check it out now one more time. Our Brute, big play of the game and at this stage I think there was just one run on the board but it went from one to four in about nine seconds from pitch to hit to home run and it was Zach Wilson. He's been hot all season. It was hot. It was 99 Fahrenheit officially at the start of this game. And Zach Wilson went from naught to 100, or naught to about 360 feet, uh, and brought home a couple of his teammates, Cam Warner and Craig Massey, as well as getting the luxury of three high fives himself as he got home. And it was a night where the Cavalry just rolled on and on and on. Zach Wilson with the brute big play of the game. Steve Kent with a personal best, equaling 13 strikeouts. Boy, oh boy, a tough night for you and your teammates. But Josh Coleman, thank you very much for making the way up uh, to have a chat with us through the course of this evening and entertain us with, entertain with some of your great stories. Yeah. All the best for the rest of the season. And I hope it's not the last we see of you down under, whether it be continuing in New Zealand or here uh, in Australia again down the track. Uh, and I'd love to, to buy you a cold one at some stage. Right. I appreciate that. Thanks so much, Chris. It's been yeah. a, a pleasure and had a lot of fun up here. It has been uh, a great night for, a ca for Cavalry fans. Uh, there's a very happy pitching coach, Brian Grinning, carrying some gear off. Not such a great night for our friends from across the ditch, but 
Uh, as Josh said, in baseball, there's always tomorrow, and here in Canberra, we will do it again tomorrow evening as Week 7 continues. Uh, a very big week, a very important week, it may well turn out to be in terms of shaping the standings. But on behalf of everyone involved at ABL TV tonight, this is Chris Coleman signing off from MIT Ballpark in Canberra where the Cavalry have run out victorious by 21 runs to four over Auckland.